Thank you and good morning. Um, welcome. Um, so this is um, an event sponsored by the Learning Policy Institute. I'm Patrick Shields. I'm the executive director. Many of you know us because we put on these events, uh, it seems like every few months here in Sacramento. We're a research and policy um, institute that goes out and tries to find from policymakers and practitioners sort of key problems in the, in the field and then to do research on them and bring that work back to, to people like yourself, to policymakers and practitioners. So we were taking a look at the implementation of the new standards and the aligned assessment in California, began to hear some things, some challenges out there in the, in the state. You know, the new standards, as you well know, ask new things of kids. They are asking for much deeper learning, for students to think critically, to be able to uh, solve novel problems, and to be able to become lifelong learners. And these are the kind of learning opportunities that students of color and students from in low-income communities have in the past been less likely to get than their more advantaged peers. And looking around the country, what we find is that in some states, these new standards and assessment, this effort at deeper learning, has actually widened the achievement gap because students of color and students from low-income communities aren't getting the opportunities that they want. So we set out here in California to take a look at some districts that were doing an extraordinary job, not just of getting high achievers to achieve higher, but to get all students, students of color, but all students, low-income students, to achieve high on the standards and closing that gap. And that's what we're gonna focus in here today. We're gonna be talking to these districts and doing some um, uh, panels with the districts and, and policymakers. So before we get going, I just wanna let you know how the day is gonna go. We're gonna start with a presentation of the research finding from the Learning Policy Institute from Ann Podolsky and, uh, and Dion Burns. And, um, and that's gonna be followed by state uh, Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman, who's gonna do some introductory remarks. Then we're gonna have a panel um, uh, with the educators from the districts, followed by a quick lunch, and then a, um, a panel of policymakers and practitioners to talk about, so what are the implications of this for the, for the state? So before uh, I introduce Ann and Dion, I just wanna thank, uh, first, the educators and the students in the positive outlier districts that opened up their schools and their classrooms to us and allowed us to come in and, and try to learn from what they uh, were doing. We'd also like to thank the California Department of Education with whom we partnered to get the data to be able to do these complex analyses that we do to identify these um, districts. Without that partnership, this study never would have been possible. Um, and then finally, we'd like to thank our funders, the Flora and William Euler Foundation, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, um, and the Sandler Foundation. And with that, I'd like to ask Ann Podolsky and Dianne Burns to come on up. Thank you. Thanks. So I don't need to tell most of you that public education in California has been in the midst of great change. The state has new standards and aligned assessments that focus on deeper learning skills like problem solving and critical thinking. The state redesigned its system of financing schools to provide increased resources for students with uh, greater needs and to provide increased autonomy to local communities in deciding how to allocate state dollars. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, in addition, the state's accountability system has shifted to broader definitions of student and school success to include measures like student achievement, student engagement, parent and family involvement, and school climate. And so, as Patrick mentioned, these changes were in part driven by the desire to provide more equitable, deeper learning for California students. And more equitable learning recognizes that many students have been underserved by their schools and communities and therefore increased uh, and extra supports, resources, and instructional shifts are needed to ensure that all students have the opportunity to develop deeper learning competencies. And deeper learning competencies focus on skills like thinking critically, problem solving, collaborating, and communicating effectively. So these are the kinds of skills that are necessary to be successful in our 21st century society characterized by complexity and continuous change. So, 
LPI had uh, three central research questions, uh, and we wanted to understand which districts in California have best supported student achievement during this period of great change. So our first question was, which districts were more successful in supporting student achievement for African-American, Latino, and white students after accounting for student socioeconomic status? What factors predict differences in student achievement? And in seven diverse districts identified as successful, what practices and policies do educators and stakeholders identify as associated with this success? So LPI took a three-phased approach to our uh, research to answer these questions. In the first phase, we ran a quantitative analysis looking at student achievement across the state. In the second, state, uh, in the second phase, we identified seven successful districts and conducted case studies in these districts in which researchers spent multiple days interviewing and observing uh, schools, educators, stakeholders, and reviewing documents and other artifacts from the district. And in the third phase, we synthesized the learnings from across these seven districts into a cross-case report. So I'll share more right now about the first phase, and then Dion will provide more detail about the other two. So uh, um, our first phase study is among the first in California to identify districts that have best supported the achievement of students during these first few years of the, the state's new assessments, as well as the factors associated with higher achievement while accounting for the socioeconomic conditions of students' families in each district. And so this really allows us to better compare the achievement of students from, uh, from similar backgrounds. Um, we also, in this analysis, look at districts that have at least 200 African American or Latino students and 200 white students. And we focus on African American and Latino students, both because research has found consistent gaps in achievement between students in these two groups and white students, and also uh, because these student groups are of sufficient size to allow us to have statistically stable estimates. And so there's other important student groups that have experienced achievement gaps. They uh, were just unfortunately too small in many districts to be able to include them in our analysis. So this figure uh, is the initial result from our, our analysis. And in this figure, each dot is a district with larger dots representing districts that have larger numbers of African American and Latino students. Smaller dots are districts that have smaller numbers of African American and Latino students. And you'll see on the left side, these are districts where white students achieve lower than predicted when accounting for the socioeconomic status of their families. And districts on the right are places where white students achieve higher than predicted. And when I say higher than or lower than predicted, I'm not, I don't mean you know, what we expect or hope for our children's future. Instead, I'm referring to the statistical definition of predicted, meaning that when we look at achievement across the state, the data tell us the uh, average achievement for students from a given socioeconomic background and a given racial or ethnic group. So now back to the figure. Districts in the bottom of the figure are places where students of color are achieving lower than predicted. And districts in the top of the figure are places where students of color are achieving higher than predicted. So consequently, districts in that top right corner are positive outlier districts because African American, Latino, and white students are all achieving at higher levels than their peers statewide. So because district demographics vary, with some districts having large numbers of African American students, other districts having mostly Latino students, and because the achievement of uh, students from these groups can vary, we looked at the results separately for amongst these two student groups. So this figure shows the 167 districts that have consistently had high achievement for both Latino and white students. And you will see in this figure the large districts of Long Beach and San Diego Unified, as well as smaller districts like Hawthorne, Chula Vista Elementary, and Sanger. And I know you can't read all the names in those figures. You can see the full list of these districts and the briefs on your table. It's also important to note that these results may look different than what's reported by the California Department of Education's data dashboard because we accounted for the socioeconomic status of students' families in our analysis. 
So in this figure, because California has a much smaller number of African American students than Latino students, we identified just 48 districts uh, in which African American students and white students consistently achieve at higher levels than their peers statewide. And again, you'll see in that top right corner, um, Chula Vista Elementary, as well as further down Hawthorne, and again, those large districts of Long Beach and San Diego Unified. So for the second part of our analysis, we wanted to better understand the factors that were associated with uh, higher student achievement on the state's new assessments when accounting for the socioeconomic status of students' families. And we found that of the school level factors, the two most important drivers of student achievement uh, were teacher qualifications and teaching experience. So the percentage of teachers with substandard credentials like emergency type permits, waivers, and intern credentials was associated with decreased student achievement. So for every 10% increase in the percentage of teachers with substandard credentials, this was associated with an approximately one month loss of learning in English language arts or math for students of color. We also found that students of color achieved at higher levels when they were in districts that had teachers with more experience. So now, Guillaume will share more about the attributes associated with these districts that beat the odds. slides are working. Okay, thank you, Anne, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, as Anne mentioned, um, in the second phase, we selected several districts that we wanted to uh, investigate more closely to understand what are the factors supporting their uh, achievement. Um, we used a range of additional criteria in selecting the districts, um, but we also intentionally selected districts that were of different sizes, uh, of de different geographic locations, and had different student populations. Uh, the, the districts are shown here. And the seven case study districts are shown on this uh, chart here. We're very grateful to have um, current and former uh, district representatives with us today. Um, perhaps since they're sitting at your tables and we'll be engaging in discussion with them later, perhaps just as I read the district names, you could uh, raise your hands to identify uh, yourselves. And uh, if uh, you'd like to hold any applause till I read all seven names, that would be great. Um, so from Butte County, there was Gridley Unified School District. In uh, Fresno County, we looked at uh, Clovis Unified and Sanger Unified School Districts. In Los Angeles County, we had Long Beach Unified and Hawthorne School District. Okay. Uh, and in San Diego County, there was San Diego Unified and Chula Vista Unified School District. Okay. Thank you all for being here today. Apologies, we're just having some trouble with the slides. But in the third phase, we brought together findings from those seven case studies together into our cross-case report. Um, we uncovered uh, nine lessons that we think are of interest to districts and to, of interest to other supporting districts. Uh, and we'll present those today to group together as three themes. The three themes were a strong, stable educator workforce, uh, educator-driven change, uh, and support for all students. So if we look at the first uh, of these, a strong, stable educator workforce, as Anne found in the quantitative report, uh, teacher qualifications were associated with outcomes uh, on the deeper learning um, measures of the California Assessment for Student Performance and Progress. Uh, we likewise found in our seven uh, case study districts that they tended to have lower rates of teacher attrition and lower proportions of teachers on emergency style uh, credentials. 
the districts that didn't wait for, for teachers to come in the door, they pr proactively put in place a number of strategies to help uh, recruit teachers and then support them. Uh, some of the things that they told us uh, were effective for them were leveraging connections with teacher uh, education uh, programs. Um, for example, in uh, San Diego and Long Beach Unified, under long-standing uh, relationships, many uh, former district educators went on to teach uh, as instructors in those programs. And in return, uh, many new teacher hires and student teachers came from local programs. They also set in place uh, clear hiring uh, philosophies and policies. Uh, uh, these, uh, these policies tended to emphasize not only teachers' academic qualifications, but also their personal dispositions and, and orientation towards uh, teaching students from all backgrounds. Uh, this was exemplified in the case of Clovis Unified, where they have a multi-stage hiring process, sometimes involving between four and seven interviews. Uh, these are at district and school levels. And principals in, in Clovis said to us that hiring the right people was among the most important responsibilities of principals in the district. Leadership in the district also tended to be stable. Many of the district representatives had had long tenures in their districts. Um, and many of the, um, there also were strong leadership pipelines. Many district representatives had previously been principals in their districts. Um, and many principals had themselves been uh, teachers. This meant that uh, leadership in the district uh, had a, a deeper understanding of local context. But also the leadership tended to be instructionally engaged. Leaders paid attention to student learning and were engaged in, uh, in teaching and learning through structures such as instructional leadership teams. But, but the districts also supported teachers uh, once hired. Uh, they did this through a range of different strategies that uh, helped build teachers' instructional capacity. Uh, things such as professional learning communities, often supported with coaching cycles, uh, a number of uh, strategies for engaging in cross-role collaboration, such as instructional leadership teams, to help teachers develop their practice. If we look, for example, at Long Beach Unified, there were a number of practices they had in place, different strategies for supporting their uh, instruct teachers' um, uh, instructional capacity. The three of them are listed here, things like instructional leadership teams, what are known as collaborative inquiry visits, where principals and teachers uh, visit other schools to find out about teaching and learning in those schools. And lesson study, it's an approach where uh, teachers and coaches uh, collaboratively plan a lesson, then uh, observe a lesson, provide feedback on it to refine these practices. Uh, what these three things have in common is that they promote collaborative exchange between teachers and observation and feedback to improve uh, teaching practice. Now, a second theme was uh, educator-driven change. Uh, the districts that we looked at took a uh, deliberate and developmental approach uh, to implementation of the standards. This was aided by the space created through the state's decision to pause annual assessment for a year. And the approach typically began with professional learning for teachers, helping them to uh, unpack the standards, understand the necessary instructional shifts, uh, and often to identify several um, what they call power standards or essential standards. These are standards that the district has chosen to make a priority for them. Um, in, in the case of Hawthorne School District, for example, um, Hawthorne brought together uh, teachers. They worked with an external teacher organization, helping teachers unpack the standards. And they involved teachers and, and coaches closely in the process. And what, what this did was it helped harness existing teacher knowledge it also helped create capacity, but also buy-in for the standards. Um, so that teacher involvement was very important in the implementation of standards for that district. Districts were also using increasingly data and evidence to inform uh, strategy in the district, to inform instruction, uh, as well as to help identify students that may be in need of additional supports. This sometimes involved increasing their investment in the data systems, bringing together a range of information about students in one place, and making it more accessible uh, to educators. And the case study districts also worked hard to align curriculum, instruction, and assessment focused on uh, deeper learning. Now, this wasn't always plain sailing, uh, but the case study districts also uh, learned from early challenges and then adjusted their approach as necessary. We look, for example, in Sanger, where they began with their professional learning community lead teachers providing the standards uh, professional learning. 
and then shifted to an approach where they trained all teachers directly, uh, grade by grade. Um, in San Diego Unified, uh, early in the implementation, district representatives said that they, they began to see some disparate interpretations emerging across schools of the desired instructional uh, shifts. So they changed tech, they uh, changed to a new professional learning system for teachers, they call the four learning cycles. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> there's one other point I wanted to add about, uh, about that. But what they did was they shifted uh, midstream, adjusting their approach, um, uh, uh, clustering the standards as uh, what they call critical concepts. They're using the, um, these two approaches, the professional learning together with the critical concepts, to help bring some more district-wide alignment uh, between uh, cur curriculum instruction and assessment and the instructional shifts required. Uh, this was explained to us by teachers in, in different ways. Some teachers told us that kids were expected before Common Core to be sitting quietly and working, and now there's more productive talking and student collaboration. And I really like the way this teacher from Clovis expressed it. She said, I always think of big T, that's T for teacher, a little s. Before Common Core, the instruction was, was more teacher directed, the teacher talking, students uh, sitting quietly and working. But now they've shifted since Common Core to big S, little t. That's uh, very student centered, student driven instruction in the district. The third theme was support for all students. And we found that all case study districts were establishing systems of supports uh, for students. This was increasingly framed to as uh, MTSS, or multi-tiered systems of support. Uh, that's the approach that brings together uh, academic, uh, data-driven interventions, together with um, evidence-based behavioral interventions and social and emotional learning. Um, and schools establish three tiers of intervention, you know, those for all students, those for students requiring uh, greater support, and those for intense or specific needs. Um, MTSS was uh, important uh, uh, in, in a couple of ways for our districts. If we look, for example, at San Diego, MTSS became one of their five uh, equity levers. These are the five levers that they saw as central to their instructional vision in the district. Uh, in Sanger, they used MTSS in a different way. They incorporated MTSS into their standards adoption. And they also incorporated MTSS into their cycle for continuous improvement. This allowed schools to pilot new assessments, uh, sorry, sorry, new innovations, such as restorative justice practice, and then use that cycle of continuous improvement uh, to learn from early challenges and adjust as necessary. All of the case study districts paid close attention to social and emotional learning. Um, we know from the, the science of learning and development that um, students' academic competencies can be supported through instruction that helps develop their social and emotional competencies also. Things such as growth mindset. Um, uh, in Clovis, we saw um, transition teams. Uh, these are paraprofessionals and teams that support the academic and social integration of uh, students as they make the transition from elementary to intermediate and on to high school. Um, in Hawthorne, the district um, took a uh, they used a range of strategies. They employed new social and emotional learning curricula. They established positive behavioral uh, intervention and support teams um, at their schools. And they provided professional learning for teachers in dealing with um, new ways of dealing with challenging student behaviors, shifting from a more punitive approach to approaches that supported and reinforced positive behaviors. Um, as a result, uh, Hawthorne seen a, a dramatic reduction in its uh, suspension rates. All of our case study districts also placed particular emphasis on supports for literacy. Uh, literacy was seen as important not only to English language arts, but also to accessing other subjects, uh, such as mathematics. And the learner-centered pedagogies that I mentioned earlier, th these were seen as important for developing vocabulary and literacy skills uh, for all students, but especially for English learners. We saw a range of strategies in Gridley Unified. Uh, they had an emphasis on uh, early literacy, there's reading recovery uh, focused in grade one. The remaining grades of middle school, there's a range of assessments and interventions uh, to support students as necessary, and then tiered interventions uh, in middle school to address any challenges that em emerge. 
All of our districts wove family and community engagement into various aspects of their work. Um, in Clovis, for example, they use not just town halls, uh, but LCAP dinners. These are events much like this, with tables where they bring together educators, uh, parents in the community. And, and through these events, they've seen greater community engagement, but also it's led to a range of initiatives to support student learning. Um, in Chula Vista, they established um, liaisons uh, for working with their many military families. Um, a new position is called promotores. Uh, these are people that help engage, especially the Spanish-speaking families in the district, with the existing family resource centers available in Chula Vista. Uh, perhaps most importantly, each of the case study districts um, had a vision for uh, student learning. Um, in, in Long Beach Unified, this was an instructional vision they called the Five Understandings model, now Six Understandings. But these visions, typically foregrounded equity, um, included statements such as those uh, here, uh, from saying every student, every day, whatever it takes. And we found that educators in these case study districts reference these statements often when talking about their instruction and working with students. Uh, in Clovis, uh, for example, teachers told us that they felt empowered to be able to make decisions that they saw were in the best interest of their students, even if that meant stepping outside the lines of some instructional programs. They talk about placing people first and, and not programs. Um, and in Hawthorne, they say that students are the focus of all decisions. But this was expressed very nicely by an educator in San Diego who underscored this emphasis uh, on equity. As she said, equity has been the overarching driving force of our system. Who has access to what? Who's getting supports? It's very strongly supported by our superintendent. And we look at everything we do uh, through an eye of equity and access. So I hope that that gives you a, just a brief overview of, of some of the elements that educators told us was important for the success in their district. Um, there's a lot more, so I encourage you to stay and listen to the panels to engage in conversations at your table with the many district representatives that are here today. Um, I'd like to finish by thanking the, the districts and the educators for taking part in the study, um, to the LPI staff that put on the event today, uh, to the many members of our research team that are listed there, Taylor, Desiree, Linda, Jane, Chris, Laura, Julie, Crystal, Anne, Sean, Catlin, Patrick, and Joan. But also thank you to um, each of you for being here today and for the work that you do in supporting students in California. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dion and Anne. Um, so that brings us to our uh, keynote um, uh, presenter today. Uh, State Superintendent of Instruction, uh, Tony Thurman. So those of you, I'm sure you know that Tony came to Sacramento with a long history of advocating and working with uh, students and children. He was a social worker for 20 years. He served on the local school board. He served as a uh, city council member. And then, of course, he was assembly uh, man before being elected to the state superintendency. And so given this experience, you know, it's no surprise that Tony came to this, his current job with a real agenda focused on uh, students with the, with the greatest needs and really focusing on issues like closing the achievement gap, literacy, mathematics, and the teacher shortage, and ensuring that all students in California are prepared for the 21st century economy. And so as you'll hear throughout the day, these are exactly the kind of concerns that the folks in the positive outlier districts um, share. And so Tony's the perfect person to get us going today to focus on that. So please welcome me in joining State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning. Good morning. Buenos dias. All right, let's get lively in here, right? Um, I have a confession for you. I am not a researcher. I often do feel like that little mouse, though, who's running on that little wheel and being observed. Because this is what I get every single day. You're responsible for all the things that are wrong in the state of education for our 6 million students. And I tell people all the time, I will accept your blame, but bring a solution to help us to serve our 6 million students and to improve that experience. And what I appreciate about today in the Learning Policy Institute is the focus on positive outliers and being strength-based 
in lifting up those who are doing the work and in spite of the gap that persists, finding ways to help our, our districts and our students to have success. Let's give a round of applause to all the outliers who are in the room. <laughs> to all the districts who are represented here. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Linda. You know, a lot of people have heard me say this. When I was in the legislature, I talked a lot about education. All I did was listen to the presentations that Linda Darling Hammond gave um, in the Assembly Education Committee. And then I decided, okay, I'm gonna do a bill on that. And I was shameless about it. And she'd come in and she'd say, professional development is the key. Or she'd say, we need, you know, um, you know, residency programs. Or she'd say that we've gotta find ways to, to work with folks who maybe were previously retired who might wanna re-enter the profession. And I would just jot down all these notes and then I would just introduce a bill um, and say that this is what we're gonna do. And some of those things actually have made it. Um, and some we're still working on. Um, but this year, um, the governor and the legislature put several million dollars into the state budget to support professional development for educators, and I think that is largely in part to the research and the work of the Learning Policy Institute and Linda Darling-Hammond. So a uh, round of applause to the entire LPI team. <laughs> and now she's a state board president, so I get to listen to her speeches and take more ideas from her and introduce them in legislation. Everyone is talking about equity, and I appreciate that. I, I can't give you a definition uh, of equity, but I can tell you that when I think about it, I contextualize it in my own story. I think about my own experience. I, I'm a storyteller. Um, I think about being the descendant of African slaves. I think about being the son of a mother who came from Panama and who was herself a teacher um, in San Jose um, who raised four kids by herself because my dad was a a soldier off in Vietnam who um, I didn't meet until I was an adult, who I found on the internet. I found my father on the internet. My first conversation with him was a conversation about the trauma that he experienced serving in the war uh, in Vietnam. And so, and then my mom was very sick and I lost my mom when I was six years old. So her four kids got split up. My mom had cancer. Two of us ended up being raised by a cousin who I never met before who lived 3,000 miles away. And she took us in and raised us as her son. Um, I was a student who grew up on the free lunch program. I grew up on food stamps. You all have heard me joke that I ate so much government cheese that I thought that USDA was a brand name. <laughs> These are programs that helped my family to overcome poverty. And the public program that helped me the most was getting a great public education. My experience in politics is one that I never knew what the state superintendent of public instruction was. Um, but I always felt propelled to help young people because of my own experience. Uh, upon arrival at the department, uh, it seemed clear to me that we had to make it a priority to help students who were in similar experiences to mine. That we have to speak to the students whose experiences are, have been difficult. I, I, before coming to the department, I taught a high school class for students who are in a juvenile camp. Imagine taking your diploma behind bars. And I think that is something that's intolerable, that we have to change. Um, and it's why we're sponsoring legislation that will ban for-profit prisons in the state of California, because we should educate and not incarcerate in the state of California. <laughs> and if we want to be serious about enacting what we learned today about the outliers, we have to move from being 41st in the nation in per-pupil spending when California is the sixth wealthiest economy in the world. We've got buying power, and we've got to spend it on our kids because I don't know what else we're buying, um, and they're gonna take care of us. And so, at the department, we've named a number of priorities, and they all center around closing the opportunity gap. And uh, I hope that you all will share, I had an embargoed copy of uh, Outliers, thank you. <laughs> but I hope that you'll share this broadly and widely, and I hope that you'll share it with us as we convene um, in just a few weeks. We're convening a virtual town hall. We've invited all 1,000 school districts to be a part of a town hall on closing the opportunity gap. We've actually decided to come at it in a slightly different way. We've held a lot of town halls on the closing the gap where we've said, come and tell us your best practices. On this one, we're coming at it in a slightly different way. We've said, tell us where you struggle because we want to deep, do a deep dive into the data and to figure out what it is in spite of all the efforts to close the gap that caused the gap to persist? And how do we help each district individually? And so on September the 24th, we're holding a virtual town hall 
where you've invited all 1,000 school districts. Um, so, Vern at CSBA, you know, please help us spread the word. <laughs> um, on what we can do with the California Department of Education to support our school districts who are doing the great work to try and close the gap. And we believe that what is happening here and what is coming out of this report around outliers is very, very important to that work. We've talked about professional development. Uh, we announced early on that we were gonna get behind an effort to expand the number of male educators of color, particularly in the elementary school grades because we know that the research shows that when young people see an educator who looks like them, that they are more likely to be successful and that all young people will be successful when they have that opportunity. I named a dozen work groups in between mediating four strikes uh, upon my swear in, uh, running the governor's state task force on charter school reform. We named a dozen work groups that focus on things like professional development, teacher recruitment and retention, how do we expand permanent funding in our schools, and of course, how do we close the achievement gap. And we'll be releasing our own uh, report out of the recommendations of our work groups. A thousand people came together and said, we want to help you have a conversation about how we close the gap, about the key issues that we address in education. Many of them are the things that, that you have heard, that we have heard. When we talk about teacher recruitment and retention, what I learned from LPI is that one of the most important factors that we must address are the working conditions that our educators experience. I hear, I, I get a lot of calls, mostly from special education uh, folks, letting me know the intensity of the work and the lack of support and the amount of paperwork. We hear you on the amount of paperwork. Um, but we also know that we have to improve compensation and we know we have to improve training and professional development. And we've been in conversation about how we might support legislation to expand induction programs and provide support to make sure that no teacher has to pay for her induction ever again uh, in the state of California. Um, we think it's a responsibility of the districts of the state to ensure that new teachers get the opportunity to have training and professional development and to change the narrative from how do we make it easier to fire a teacher to how do we make it easier to recruit and keep and support a teacher so that every teacher gets uh, a mentor or a coach and that when you're struggling, you get feedback. And that we changed the way it was in my school district when, when there was an opportunity for training or professional development. This is usually how it went. One teacher at a school would get selected to go to that training and would be expected to come back to their district and do a turnaround training for everybody at the school on their own time. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but where I come from, they say you get what you pay for. And so if we don't invest in the kind of professional development that will allow all teachers to have adequate professional development, we'll continue to struggle with our abilities to retain and support our workforce. And I come from the Bay Area, and one of the things that I've found in many of the districts that I've talked to is that many of our educators can't afford to live where they work. In the district where my kids go to school every year, we lose 200 teachers. I don't know how you close the gap with that type of churn when you lose 200 and you have to replace 200 teachers every single year. We surveyed them and what we found is the number one reason why they leave is because they cannot afford to live where they work. And so until we figure out compensation and better training, we've been experimenting with other ways to support teacher recruitment and retention. And so we've been pushing this idea for the last three or four years about having a teacher housing program and building affordable housing for teachers and classified staff. And thankfully, I can report to you today that in this year's budget, the governor and the legislature provided millions for school districts to build affordable housing for teachers and classified staff to help us have the workforce to support our students. And so thank you for those of you who advocated for that and who get that we have to create the opportunities to support all of our teachers. There's six million students in our state. Many of them have an experience that's very similar to mine, in some case, more difficult. And I believe that each and every one of them can learn. I was told once when I was campaigning for this job, well, I was told a lot of things when I was campaigning for this job, and I won't repeat all of them, but I'll, re I'll share this one with you. A person said to me once, Tony, you should focus only on the kids who show promise and potential. I told this person that I rejected that notion. All of our kids show promise and potential. 
it's incumbent on us. That's a great place to put your hands together. Eh? It's incumbent on us to help them to develop their promise and potential. I was very cognizant of the fact that if someone had made that statement about me, a, a, a quiet kid from the other side of the tracks who could have easily just fallen through the gap, that I wouldn't be standing before you. I'm very conscious of what my experience might have been, but for the fact that I had teachers who said to me, you can do it. In spite of your humble beginnings, life will be better for you with this education. And when I struggled, the more I struggled, the more my teachers dug in and said, you're gonna get across the finish line. I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful to all the educators in this room. I'm grateful for all of you for being outliers. Let's be great outliers to help all six million of our students in the state. Enjoy the rest of the conference and thank you. Now for the exciting part, we're going to have a panel of um, educators talk to us. So come on up. Okay, as soon as we get mic'd up here, we'll, we'll get going. Um, but let me, I'm going to let Kent introduce the panel. These are our educators from our uh, different districts. Um, Kent McGuire, who is the uh, head of the education program at the William and Flory Hewlett Foundation, um, is going to be moderating the panel. Um, Kent, previous to this, was the uh, president of the Southern Education Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, previous to that, he was the dean at Temple University, the dean of education. Previous to that, he was the assistant secretary of education. So Kent comes to us with a great deal of experience and background in um, education and schooling. And with that, um, Kent, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. See, don't need to be mic twice. Let's see if we can get that away. Well, um, it was both great to hear about the research and um, wonderful to hear from Tony and the leadership he's exercised um, here in California. It's a good time now to make the connection between research and practice. And we've got the best possible panel of folk who uh, uh, were in the study. I'm a bit of an echo still, aren't I? Yeah. Let me see what I can do about that. <coughs> you sound good out there? Well, my colleagues up here, they're, they're, not, they're not feeling me. Let me see if I can turn <laughs> this down. Yeah, all right. So. Uh, you mean if I go this way? I'm, thank you for that. Thank you for that. I don't want to have my back to you. Oh, that's okay. You all right? Yeah. All right. You know what would be good? Why don't you come over here, and I'll sit in the middle. Okay. We'll just do a little bit of engineering. How about yeah, that? That would be great. Perfect. This better? Yeah. I'm going to look at you for the rest of the time. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. Um, so. Um, I'm Kent McGuire, I appreciate that introduction. Um, just really uh, spending enough time in California to appreciate uh, the work that's going on here, uh, and I'm having a ball. Um, I finally got my wife to come out here about seven months ago. Uh, we live in the Bay Area. I told her that the weather uh, was going to be marvelous compared to Atlanta. <laughs> it took until April before she believed me because it rained continuously. <laughs> and she's in Atlanta now, so I'm a little worried. I'm a little, I'm a little worried. Um, let's see. Um, there were some themes that emerged for me through the study. Um, focus on teaching and learning. Um, find good people place them in positions for which they're qualified, uh, create supports for them to learn and improve, I'm talking about the adults, uh, empower them to do good work, address the social as well as academic needs of students, and voila, you'll actually get good outcomes for kids, right? It's amazing that we need a study to actually tell us those things, um, uh, but we do, it's very important. 
uh, I want to see now if that rings true um, with this panel. Mm -hmm. And we'll just get right to it. Let me just say, before I introduce the panelists, my understanding of the work we're going to do over the next hour and a half or, or close to two hours. We're going to spend about 60 minutes up here where I will be um, serving up questions for the panel. Um, and we'll see if we can make that conversational. If any of you hear something that another of your colleagues says you want to comment on, please look at me um, and just jump in. And uh, then we're going to uh, take about 20 minutes uh, to have conversations at these tables um, in order to try to find three or four of the most important additional questions uh, that we want to bring uh, to the panel's attention. I will field those questions and we'll have a conversation about those. Um, and then I'll make sure uh, that if there's anything else, we should have asked these folk but didn't. Um, I'll give them an opportunity to tell us uh, and sum up. That, I think, is the design for, uh, you know, for the next period of time. And with that, I left my notes in Menlo Park, and the traffic was such that I dare not go back and get them. Um, but I have my computer. I'd like to introduce, oh, can I have those? Yeah. I'd like to introduce, um, maybe I'll do it this way. I'll just introduce one panelist at a time. You won't have to forget uh, kind of who they are. When I do that, mm -hmm. it would be terrific if you could say a little something about your school district, mm -hmm. uh, set enough context um, for the good questions that I'm, uh, I'm going to ask. Um, and so I'd like to start with Dr. Sophia Freire, uh, who is the Chief of Leadership and Learning at San Diego Unified School District. Um, when I grow up, I want a title like that. Like that. I, I want a title like that. Um, so, one of the themes in the study uh, had to do um, with vision, um, a vision for teaching and learning and for centering equity uh, in, that, in that vision. I am really curious, um, Sophia, if you could talk about how that happened in San Diego Unified. Um, equity is something that is often in the eyes of the beholder means many different things to many different people. Uh, so it's no simple matter to get people unified around that. How'd that happen in San Diego? Yeah, and it's really difficult to talk about in uh, a short response, so I'm gonna do my best. I'll tell you a little bit about our district first. San Diego Unified serves a little over 100,000 students from preschool to high school. We're actually even doing some efforts to go from crib to college uh, in some of the new structures that we're creating in San Diego Unified. Um, our superintendent was appointed in 2013, and she's brought consistency, stability, and coherence to a really large district, which isn't um, easy to do. She, along with our board, are committed to equity. We've defined equity as giving every single student exactly what he or she needs, when they need it, how they need it, and in the way that they need it. And so we have a clear definition for equity um, in our district. Uh, you saw the quote, we look at everything we do through a lens of equity. It's an important part of our work. Um, and we're at the point that we're not apologetic about the fact that we give the kids who need more we give them more. And so um, we also have a very clear vision and a deliberate, deliberative plan on how we're going to um, meet the promise of equity for all of our kids. 
And so our vision is centered around quality neighborhoods, I'm sorry, quality schools in every single neighborhood. We also talk about unlocking genius for each and every student. Our state superintendent talked about that every student has promise and potential. We call that genius. We believe in unlocking genius of every single student. We also talk about um, maximizing growth and joy in every single interaction we have with kids. We believe that outcomes are important, but we also believe that students should experience memorable things in school that they'll, um, they'll remember their, their entire lives. So that's important for us. Um, our equity work is really around two center or core pillars. The first pillar is really around access and ensuring that our students have access. And we focused and we concentrated that work in our secondary schools. So we spent a lot of time looking at secondary school master schedules. We uh, did an analysis of transcripts <coughs> Like we did a sampling, we, we looked at like over 800 transcripts to see the access and the quality of uh, courses that our students were in. And we also spent a lot of time in classrooms. So when you walk into an advanced placement classroom in a very diverse school and you're only seeing white and Asian students in that classroom, there's a problem. And so we were, got very proximate to the problem and we didn't just look at overarching data. We looked at transcripts, we looked at students in classrooms and um, we began to do some really um, deliberate work on access. And so our board approved A through G for all in 2009 and they charged our superintendent who's here, Cindy Martin, um, who's led um, all of this work, um, it was her, it was, it was up to her to actualize and make good on this promise of A, G, A through G for all. And a lot of people thought that our graduation rates were going to decrease because of this, uh, these new requirements. And in fact, they, they increased. And so we had increased uh, graduation rates with more rigorous requirements for kids. We also launched an effort around advanced placement for more students and underrepresented students. And so we did that deliberately as well. We partnered with EOS to do that. And our current uh, focus is on with our students with disabilities to ensure that they have access to the core and they're being included in general education and for our English language learners as well. Our second pillar is around success. So it's not enough to, we don't really look at it as achievement gaps, we look at it as opportunity gaps. And it's not enough to give students access. We have to create systems and structures to ensure that they actually have success. And um, earlier you heard about MTSS, that's what we're about. We're about <coughs> ensuring that we look at data to predict and anticipate which students may struggle, and we put systems in place for both academic supports and social emotional supports and behavioral, behavioral supports for kids to ensure that uh, kids have the supports they need and um, they have it before they fail. Uh, lastly, I wanted to comment that we have um, some equity levers, and so we have five equity levers that were mentioned before. Um, strong literacy instruction, authentic collaboration, meaningful engagement for students, meaningful um, assessments, and lastly, relational leadership. Those are the five equity levers that drive our equity work. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anything you want to say about the structures or supports that have been created in San Diego to help the adults live into this vision or to pull those levers? Um, we invest a lot in building capacity, the capacity of our leaders and our teachers. And so we have partners um, and we do that work in collaboration with them. So one of our great partners have been uh, Marzano Research. We do a lot of work on high reliability schools. And if you, um, 
are familiar with that research, it basically has five levels. We've focused on the first three levels of Marzano research, and uh, the first level is safe, collaborative, and inclusive classrooms. The second uh, level is um, high quality instruction in every classroom. And the third layer or level is a guaranteed viable curriculum. So the past two years, that's what we focused on. Earlier you heard about our um, critical concepts, and the work we've done in Unified is to ensure that we're demystifying the new common core standards. They're not really new anymore. And so what we've done is created critical concepts, which is basically a bundling of standards. We know teachers don't teach standards in, a, in an isolated way. So critical concepts have enabled us to do this work. Another key partner is the National Equity Project. And so they've been with us for a very long time. They help us um, create a common language and a framework for talking about equity in our district. So you'll hear educators um, throughout our district talk about interrupting um, inequities and doing it with grace and skill. And we also talk about interrupting in inequities or inequitable practices with skill and grace. So those are key partners. There's a lot we do in our district in terms of professional development for our principals. We have principal institutes that are well planned and we have um, experts that come out. Pedro Noguera has spoken to our, um, our leaders. Uh, Yvette Jackson has also spoken to our leaders. And then we're recently going to have uh, this year Zaretta Hammond also speak to our leaders. So there's a lot that we do to build the capacity. The last thing I'll say, because I got the one minute uh, mark, is that we also do student-centered coaching cycles. We can do an entire session on the success we've had with student-centered coaching cycles. Thank you, Sophia, so much. Now, yes, we have some help, but if you see me looking at you in a certain kind of way, uh, you can look at me, too, and um, that'll help us keep time. Um, I've watched the country struggle with trying to adopt and implement standards. Um, it was interesting how little opportunity teachers actually had to weigh in uh, on how we might think about that. That was not true, though, in Hawthorne. Um, and I want to introduce to you Brid Bridget Cruz Brown. And um, I asked her, I said, well, what's your title, Bridget? And she gave me the wrong answer. She said, I'm just a teacher. And I said, well, hey, that's, that's, there's no better title. That's even better than Sophia's title. <laughs> um, could you take a few minutes to kind of talk uh, about the approach in Hawthorne uh, to adopting these Common Core standards and, and say something about the ways in which teachers were involved in that process? You bet. So um, Hawthorne is a really small district. We are right by LAX down in Los Angeles. We serve about 8,500 kids, of which 85% receive free and reduced lunch. We have about 20% African American students and roughly 71% Latino students. So we are definitely an urban group. Um, I've been in Hawthorne School District for almost 20 years now, and we are definitely a family. We're so small that everyone knows one another. So when the new standards came out, we as teachers were very anxious. We didn't know what to expect. And the call came from our assistant superintendent, Dr. Brian Markarian, and what he did was he sent out an invitation to teacher leaders asking if they wanted to come in and be part of a committee at the district level. So he invited us all in and he created a team the team had district level administrators, site level administrators, it had literacy coaches on it, we brought in a couple consultants from the Talking Teaching Network, and then there were these teacher leaders from the site. And the purpose of the committee was just to give us time to dive deeply into the new Common Core standards, compare them to the 97 standards that we've been working on, and see exactly what kind of work was ahead of us. 
Once we figured it out as a committee, then we were allowed to then go back to our sites and in that safe learning environment, because our teachers were our learners at that point, we presented new PD to them. So we would pilot every activity first at the district office, then bring it back to our site and present it to the teachers there, hoping that because it was coming from a colleague, a friend, somebody who was known, it would be better, better received. And really it was. Um, it was just a very surrounding environment. Mr. Or Dr. Dr. Markarian was very clear that we were asking teachers to do something new and everybody who tried was to be celebrated. Everything was to be encouraged. There were no failure lessons. It was more like, this was our first attempt. Now let's learn and move forward. So everything that didn't work out was just a learning experience. Um, and when we would come back to the district every month, they would debrief. How did the PD go at your sites? And this was the first time we really realized that district level admin was listening. Because before it was, they would tell you what to do, we would do it. This time, we were coming back to them with concerns. We needed supports. We needed more practice with this. And the admin from the district level started to, to provide and respond to that. We would show up, and they would have this beautiful agenda written. And after hearing the debrief, we would restructure the entire day. So when we came back to the sites, we had answers for teachers. And I really think that that set kind of a focus, an instructional focus for us. For example, one of the standards that was brand new to everybody was collaboration. We'd never taught students how to collaborate before. We didn't know how to do it. So we piloted some lessons together at the district. We brought it back to our sites, and we let it go. The coaches at the site level would come into the classrooms, and they would demo those lessons for teachers. They would show us how to do it. Then we would have a unit planning collaboration where we would get to sit with the coach and talk with other at the same grade level content area teachers and say what was working. We needed help, we needed more information. We, we dialogued about that new standard. Then the coach would come in and observe us trying to do a collaboration lesson. They'd give us all kinds of feedback. Try this, do that. It was fantastic. So that by the time our site level administrators came in to do what in our district we call sacred time, every Thursday, 9 to 11, administrators in classrooms doing their observations, we already knew what the administrators were looking for because of this collaborative language. They had been there every step of the way. So they knew. And it was because we felt so safe and supported in that environment, I think Hawthorne had a great transition to the Common Core Standards. Terrific. Well, and I assume that's part of the culture <coughs> in the district. Now, it doesn't just apply to standards adoptions? No, we have something called the Hawthorne Way in uh -huh. Hawthorne. And, uh -huh. and really, that is that every person who works in Hawthorne is considered a member of the family. And most of us have been working together so long, our kids have grown up together, and uh, so we really are a true family. But we call it the Hawthorne Way. That's cool. That's, that's, that's cool. Um, you also focused on school climate. We did. What, uh, what led to that, and um, how has that, how's that gone? So we were like everyone else. Uh, we realized that we had a problem with suspension. We had so many of our minority students getting suspended all the time. Uh, the district decided to go ahead and, and adopt the PBIS, Positive Behavior of Intervention and Supports. So they brought in the new procedures, had a full district-wide PD day, and about a couple months into it, we realized that we couldn't just change the procedures that we actually had to look at changing teacher mindset about discipline, about behavior in general. That's when they brought in UCLA's Center X. Mm -hmm. And we worked with uh, Dr. Tanika Orange and Shiraki Holly, and they came in and did professional development on using cultural responsive teaching techniques. Sadly, we had just been teaching as if every kid were the same. So what we learned is different cultures learn different ways, and they literally brought us strategies they wanted us to try. Um, one of the things we noticed was the kids needed movement built into lessons. I mean, subtle things like using the activity four corners where they have to walk across the room, or selecting a partner from a different table where they had to just get up and move. 
We also found that children needed to talk before they shared an answer aloud. A lot of them just needed the affirmation from a peer to feel more confident about their answers. And just by doing little things like that, our student engagement actually skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Our superintendent is famous for saying an engaged student is a well-behaved student. Mm -hmm. um, and we really did see that happening. So behaviors immediately decreased once we started changing mindset about it. However, PBIS is not the end all be all. And uh, we have some teachers who are still experiencing what I would call a productive struggle with it. So uh, our superintendent immediately took notice to that and we convened a committee. So now once a trimester, we have a PBIS committee from, anyone can be on the committee. So if you wanted to voice your concerns about PBIS, you just go the day of the committee meeting. Our superintendent was so interested that she actually started attending the meetings herself because she wanted to know what were the, um, the problems with instruction, what, what were teachers really facing out there. So we feel like we are committed to the PBIS uh, way of doing things. It's made our suspensions, especially with African American kids, go from 12% down to 4%. That's big. It is. It's huge. So I, I think at this point we're committed to staying on that road, but you know, behavior and discipline is always going to be a journey. I, I really think we'll never get to a specific destination there. But. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I was um, I was described as a student who loved to talk. Mm. Yeah, that's, you would like my class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The issues that I would surface, my mother was a teacher, her sister was a teacher, my, I actually had her in the second grade, <laughs> my uncle was a teacher, and the news about things I would do, my indiscretion, <laughs> would actually show up at home before I got there. That's, that's. Chris, let's, let's turn to Gridley. Um, Where is Gridley? Yeah, that's right. Where is, where is Gridley? Yeah, so we're about uh, 50 to 55 miles north of Sacramento on Highway 99. We are between the city of Chico and Yuba City. It's a very rural district. We've got um, about 6,000 people in our town. We've got 2,100 children. 2,100 children. That's why I put you over yeah, there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, our school configurations are quite unique. So we have one school for TK, kindergarten, and first grade. Next school is second through fifth. And then we have a middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth, and then a high school. So at my site alone, I will have eight or nine teachers per grade level. Wow. So um, while there are processes and structures and visions that um, you've all uh, created, the truth is you also have to intervene yep. when you have very specific uh, challenges uh, uh, to, to work on. Could you talk about the reading recovery work in Gridley? First of all, tell us what it is. So okay. We're all clear about that. So uh, reading recovery, we, we implemented reading recovery in 1999, which is a long time ago. Um, there are probably not too many districts that still has reading recovery, unfortunately. Um, we have about 57% Latino, 77% socially economically disadvantaged. And when we started the, the process, um, with our assessments, we noticed that only 13% of our Latino kids were reading at grade level and we knew that we needed to find a solution. Uh, we started working with our county office and at that time, um, they were, migrant education was under them and they had an individual that was an instructor of reading recovery. So she was um, like the, the top teacher in the area for implementing reading recovery. So she came to our site, we started talking, we had an influx of funds, which is amazing. And we decided to jump in with both feet and implement reading recovery. So we've trained that first year six teachers, and it's a very intense first grade literacy program. So what we do is after we assess the students, we use some phonics tests and things like that in first grade, then <coughs> excuse me, we start selecting children that need additional help. 
and um, they will work with the student one on one for 30 to 40 minutes per day. Every day for 12 to 16 to 18 weeks, whatever they need. So a lot of people go, wow, you've got people that can do that one on one? Yes, we do. And our district has believed in it. Um, they never, when we hit the Great Recession, there was no discussion about cutting that program at all because they've seen the benefit. Wonderful. Um, that just tells you a little bit. A little about bit about it. Yeah. Sure. And, and so how are special needs students doing in Gridley? Yep. Um, and what over and above reading recovery uh, are you working on or considering to, to kind of help them? Yeah. So our job in first grade, and what I worry about in the state is that we start state testing now in third grade. So I think a lot of time at the site level, principals don't really focus in on what is happening in kindergarten and first grade to get those kids ready when they take the state test in third grade. So when back when we had the CSTs, um, we, we noticed that those students, again, were not performing well. Um, after we implemented reading recovery and some other multiple assessments, and we really focused on K3, our scores increased tremendously. For example, our, um, our overall school score at the two through five score at the end of doing the CSTs was at 850. They made rapid progress. More students were reading at proficient than they ever had before, even at the end of first grade. We noticed after one year of implementing reading recovery, we went from 13% of our Latino kids reading um, at grade level to 55. So we knew right then, wow, we had something. Currently, all of our first graders, Latinos, special ed students, we are able to get all those kids reading proficiently at the end of first grade, um, 80 to 90%. Great, great. And what our job is, is to keep kids out of special ed. That is our job, okay? Because we know once they start in special ed, they're pretty much lifers. I have not seen too many kids that we've been able to get out of special ed. So our job is to get them early. You, think, you hear early intervention all the time. And if I was in charge of the state of California, there'd be reading recovery in every single school. It, it, it makes a huge <clears throat> difference. Um, it has not only made a difference for our students, but our community, um, our parents. Um, I don't know about you guys, but at, at our school or our district, the Latino parents, um, they will do anything to help their children anything at all, even if they can't speak English. So we expect parents to work with their kids every night, even if they can't, if, even if they can't read English. They just need to sit down with their child, have their child take out their book, which by that time, the ones that they're taking home, are, they read them enough, they're pretty independent, but just to get that nightly practice over and over and over, and to still in them that that's important. There's not a greater gift that we can give to our kids than reading recovery or then reading. Then reading. Then reading. Right, right, right. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank you. He, he didn't put the signs up on you. I know, I was kind of waiting, yeah. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay, I hope so. <laughs> Pressure is on, right? Let's see what okay. happens next. Francisco. Right. Chula Vista. Chula Vista. Uh, you know what it means? What does that mean? Pretty view, I mean, a cute view. Cute view. Cute view, you know why? You look down south, you see the beautiful lights of Tijuana, five miles away. Ah, look ah, up north, ah, beautiful ah, lights of San Diego. Ah, east, mountains of San Miguel. The west, a beautiful ocean. The ocean. Yeah. Mm. All right, you, view. You, you've, set, view. you've set a lot of contests. You'd view, I did. <laughs> 30,000 students. Tell us about the students, yeah. 30,000 students, uh, large military population. About 10% of our students are military. High transiency rate because of the military and being so close to the, the border, we average about 17% transiency uh, throughout uh, uh, the year. Uh, mobility rate for teachers, though, it's excellent, about 3%. So our teachers tend to stay 
at our district. About 70% of our teachers, 60 to 70% live in Chula Vista. My own kids went through Chula Vista, so there's just great pride in, in the city of Chula Vista. All right, let me ask you a question. Tell me. Um, so, you know, another word that's in vogue, our learning community. Right? Exactly, yes. Um, probably also something that could right. mean <coughs> lots of things to right. different people, right? right? Um, you all have uh, what you call professional learning cycles. Do I have that right? Right, right could exactly. You, could you talk about right. um, what you mean by that and um, how you put them together and what's important? Well, those? technically it follows very much like many of our districts do, right? You, you plan for change. And then change happens, some more than other times, and you look at data. And then the data will dictate whether you need to uh, kind of tinker with the change. And, and then it's an iterative process, right? So technically, many of our districts in California follow it. But I, would, I want to emphasize the organic aspect of this professional learning cycle. Because I think that's where the, the power, the innovation, that ability to grow as a profession occurs. Uh, because, you know, Chula Vista is a medium-sized district, about 30,000 students and 46 schools. But we break down our district into cohorts. So we have cohorts of uh, six to seven schools led by a lead principal, right? So we have a distributed leadership model where our principals act, some principals act as a quasi-administrator. Uh, each of my district office a uh, cabinet member also has a group of 10 schools that they supervise and work with. And we are all learners. Mm -hmm. And that learning cycle is distributed from the district office to the classroom level. Our teachers are part of this instructional learning team, and they are leaders in the learning. We have actual, you know, being a teacher is a very tough task. And teachers need to have the opportunity <laughs> to learn, to communicate, to share their frustrations. And we have, by the way, time during the instructional days where our teachers are offered the ability to communicate, the, abil the ability to fr reflect on their practice. We do not expect during these learning cycles for a lesson to be done in perfection. We have safe practice time where teachers have time to work on these lessons. We have time where teachers visit each other during the instructional day as well and offer advice to fellow teachers. And by the way, principals are, are, uh, are part of that process as well. We have during our professional development time, we're weaning out of the consultancy aspect and we're having principals and teachers together and coaches lead the professional development. Uh, so so when, you, when you look at it, this interdependency within, the, within our system is very tightly wound, where mm. everyone is a learner, there is safe practice incorporated, and, and the reflection and feedback is ongoing. I myself take time, I spend 40% at the school site. I visit every school site twice a year mm. and I go to every classroom and I, I get to learn from them mm -hmm. you know what they're learning what their frustrations are what what are those next steps so uh, we've taken it into a very organic humanistic level this learning so let me ask you the same question I asked Chris um, I mean I'm curious right. um, how this professional development work uh, connects to what happens in the classroom. You talked about visiting mm -hmm. London. Mm -hmm. um, um, but what do you think the dividend has been, been especially um, for the students we have struggled uh, to educate uh, you know, the most? I believe part of our feedback is what are those student outcomes? We, we don't only look at student at teacher behavior we also see what students are doing. 
and we have a protocol set on what the expectations are with students. We have a, what we call an, a um, district instructional focus that focuses on high impact language development strategies. So part, part, one of the things that we do each year, we started a couple of years ago, is to test the social emotional mm -hmm. index of each child. One of the things that we found out is that our kids have a very tough time expressing their emotions. So we invested 15 minutes a day utilizing Sanford Harmony to really focus on how to communicate and discuss internally what they're feeling and externally how they're feeling among each other. And you know, I, I, I think that was an, has been an amazing outcome in, in helping accelerate learning, seeing our you know, English learners um, mm -hmm. really scoring at a very high rate redesignating at a very high rate. At one point, we were close to 40% English learners. Now we're in the low 30s. So we, it's been a significant impact on, on our students. Terrific, terrific. And, and, and I would like to add one thing. You, one we, one we more got, thing. We're good. Do I have a we're minute? We got I have a, oh, I have yeah, two minutes, great. Right. Yeah. You know, in, in the last couple of years, I need to share, there's been a, a real interesting increase of a uh, target group called homelessness. I mean, just last year, our homelessness population went from 80 to 185. Mm. And I think that effects on students, especially in the area of trauma, is very significant. And if, if, if we don't take heed on the social emotional aspect of our students, yes, academics is important, absolutely. But how we, we utilize these important um, attributes of you know, regulating one's emotions, recognizing and how to articulate your emotions, right? It, 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 it is so critical. And when we do these circles and having kids talk about, I had a hard weekend, you know? I went with Dia, had a big, a big fight, and then I had to move to a friend's house. I mean, these things happen every day. And I just, I, we're just so fortunate to connect with many of our assets. You know, our community assets, such as the food bank, where a food bank donates every Friday 190 backpacks to our students. And inside the backpacks is food, enough for the students to survive the weekend. And it's done every week. So our, our connection to our community is also that interdependency, not only within the district, but outside of our district is so critical, especially with uh, the trauma that we're facing in our society, uh, specifically in the area of homelessness. Thank you. Um, you know, we're just, we're on the clock. We're doing, we're going wonderful. Um, I'd like to ask Wendy, um, who's the principal of the California Academy of Mathematics and Science, um, uh, to, you know, I used to run the Blue Ribbon uh, yep. program. Mm -hmm. and familiar with our school. So I'm familiar, well, I'm familiar with what you had to do uh, to become recognized. Is what I would uh, is what I would say, and uh, I'm just real curious. Uh, in your case, um, I know that um, uh, you've done a lot to create opportunity for students um, uh, to um, uh, engage uh, them, and um, I wonder if you could describe um, your approach to deeper learning. You know, we have a long-standing agenda at Hewlett with regard to deeper learning. Uh, we ran some focus groups. What we learned was the closer we got to students and to teachers, the less they actually knew what the term meant, mm -hmm. right? That made us pretty nervous. Um, I think in, in you all's case, you're sort of got past the term and, and did things that made it real for folks. Could you talk about that? Sure, I'd be happy to. 
thank you all for having me here today. Um, so I'm from Long Beach Unified School District. Uh, I think as, as a district, I'd like to think that uh, we're really a small town with 85 schools and about 72,000 students. Um, it really does feel like a, town, mm -hmm. a small town, but it is a big, large urban school district, um, the third largest in the state. Um, but the way that we approach deeper learning and um, instruction and supporting our students is really in um, thinking about that we are this small town that supports all of our kids in the city. Um, and so uh, we, in thinking about deeper learning, the district really has, we as a, as a whole system, have a very clear vision into what we want this instructional, really we have an instructional framework with these four understandings and this started with uh, the transition to Common Core and what that would look like for our students and how our classrooms would look different. Um, and it started with four understandings, thinking about how will we um, ensure that every single classroom you walk into, uh, not, not just the AP courses, not just the accelerated courses, not just the honors courses, but every single classroom that you walk into across the district, in the entire system, um, we see standards aligned instruction. We see rigor in those classrooms. Um, that was the first understanding. The second understanding was, or is, um, that we see our students grappling with complex texts and complex tasks. That there is rigor every day in your lessons. Um, our third understanding is that our students have the ability to talk, as someone mentioned earlier, um, that they have the ability to collaborate, to work together, to learn from each other, that it's not just a teacher up on the stage uh, uh, giving that instruction, but that they are having the opportunity to process that information. Um, and then our fourth understanding was around formative assessment. And so what type of evidence are our teachers collecting every day in class in real time and thinking about what happens next? Collecting that data and, and acting on it. And so if a student isn't understanding or that group of students isn't understanding, what are we doing to then address those things? And so with that big picture of we all um, came to this, you know, these understandings, uh, thinking this is what we want to see on our classrooms. And it was years. Um, it actually turned into five understandings, um, which is what's in the, in the report. In 2018, we went to six understandings. So we'll see if we have seven understandings soon. But, um, but the fifth understanding really was around um, how our instructional, instructional leadership teams work together um, at the site level. And so as a site principal, um, it's all of the department chairs and grade level leads and how we work together to ensure that these are the practices that we see in our classrooms of every department and every grade level. Um, and so that deeper learning was really a, everyone is a part of this. And so our fifth understanding is around collective efficacy and that, that belief that we can work together and make that change across not just one school and one classroom at a time, but across an entire system. Um, and so deeper understanding though goes beyond just what you see in the classroom, but also uh, a big focus for us is around access and equity um, in regards as in particular to uh, students having access to advanced placement courses, um, having access to dual enrollment, um, both at our community colleges and our local community colleges and our um, universities. And so we're lucky to have uh, a really strong partnership with Long Beach City College in our city and with Cal State University Long Beach where our students have the ability to enroll in um, courses and I have a student here with me today and she'll give you a little bit of what that, what, what that is like for our students. Um, but that's, a, that's a, big, a big piece of that collective efficacy and everybody thinking about um, how we support our students and give them access to a rigorous curriculum to uh, these courses and opportunities where they really are prepared for post-secondary and career options after. Thank you. Um, and what about, you also have um, uh, in Long Beach focused on the pipeline, the teacher pipeline, right? Yeah. You've got to grow your own um, initiative. Could you talk about that? Um, it's we call the Long Beach College Promise. Um, and really it starts with our students at a very young level. And so mm -hmm. it's a K-12 um, system of encouraging our students and providing them the opportunity to really understand what college going really means um, and being prepared for that. And so it starts 
with our elementary school students visiting our local community college on a field trip at a certain grade level and our middle school students really understanding what it means to complete an A through G course requirement. And so by the time our high school students are getting prepared to apply to school, the College Promise is a guarantee that if they meet the minimum requirements that they can be accepted um, guaranteed admission into Cal State Long Beach. Um, and if they go to Long Beach City College, they'll have two years of tuition free um, education. And part of that pipeline is really looking at our students as this investment into um, our city, our community, and our schools, um, that they are part of our resource. All of our, we're a link learning district. Mm -hmm. right. um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with link learning. So we're a link learning district. Every single one of our high schools has uh, industry aligned pathways for our students. And that gives them an opportunity not just to learn about education, which we do have many pathways that focus on um, service careers and including education, um, but really any industry and exposes our students to what that looks like to go into the job force and to uh, pursue a career in post-secondary education. So with our partnerships with Long Beach City College and Cal State Long Beach, uh, many of the teachers that come and teach in our school system, um, many came up through our, our program, went through the Long Beach College Promise, ended up at Long Beach City College, and for those that decide to go into teaching, go into the credential program where our own district um, teachers and district leaders, our curriculum leaders and uh, district level administrators teach in the credential program. And so if you are a student in Long Beach, you can go through our system, get two years free at your local community college, guaranteed admission to Long Beach State, go into the teaching credential program, be taught by uh, people that work in the district about good teaching practices, and then come in and student teach in our district, um, become a teacher, and then go into the teacher support pipeline. And so, and that extends all the way through to our supporting our district leaders. Um, so there's a pipeline for uh, identifying uh, teachers who are potential leaders and um, there's a lot of professional development that is um, a part of the program and so mm -hmm. if we have a teacher that came through that system has been teaching for a few years is interested in leadership there's an additional pipeline for mm -hmm. that um, so that you are uh, receiving professional development and um, sort of understanding we also have the Long Beach way Right. Oh, it's um, and, and part of that is, is really thinking about how do we support all students. So even though there's 84 schools, I might have said 85 before, but 84 schools, um, that means there's 84 principals out there that are looking at how do we support and develop our teachers to be leaders on our campus and then to potentially be site leaders, district leaders, curriculum leaders. Um, so it's really this idea that we're all supporting our students, but we're supporting the entire small community. Soups and nuts. And um, I'm guessing that's given rise to uh, a lot of commitment and civility uh, throughout the ranks of the workforce in Long Beach. Is that true? Yeah, good. All right. Well, let's pressure test all of that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and talk to a group. First of all, I, Sabrina, I want to say, you know, that you could find the time to take off a minute to talk with us. Uh, uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. We had a meeting in San Diego about a week ago, and we had a panel of about seven students um, talking to a collection of educators, um, and we just learned a bunch. Uh, remind you uh, just how useful it is to actually listen to the students, right? That kids. Yeah, yeah, it's a kind of blinding insight. So, um, so we know, and we have heard it in various ways, that the extent to which we can actually engage students, you know, really unlocks uh, their inclination to to learn, right? Um, I am just curious, uh, uh, Sabrina, uh, as you think about your experience, uh, if you could just talk about um, things that the schools have done to, um, to really motivate you. I understand that uh, there's a lot of project-based learning uh, kind of activity. 
um, um, in your school and talk about it. The ninth grade year, um, we had to innovate an idea or a project. Or Can you not hear well? No. Hold on. And then. If I could just get my own. Okay. Can I just like get that? Can I take your eyes? Hello? Yeah. Mine. Should we hold it? Here, mine. Yeah, just hold it. Just, just hold, hold it. it. That Let's try it. Yeah. Oh, I can hold it. Okay, so then, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> all right. For the tenth grade year, uh, we have to, based on what we learned in our classes. So, for example, uh, AP Physics and the Principles of Engineering classes, um, we have to build a roller coaster and then pitch the idea to the. T um, and then, as an uh, as an eleventh grader, we have to then create like a museum as a whole eleventh grade class and then present that to um, parents and teachers and other students. And then for the 12th grade year, we do, um, if you're in the engineering pathway or in the biotechnology pathway, you have to do a big project. So for example, for me, I'm in the engineering pathway. So this year for me, I would have, I'm in a class where we're working kind of like a corporate and we haven't, um, it hasn't been told to us what our project will be this year, but we will work together as a, a uh, whole team, like the whole class, for the th throughout the whole year, and just develop this big project that's unknown yet. Um, so, my favorite project would be the tenth grade year, um, where we had to build a roller coaster with all our knowledge about physics and then principles of engineering, where we had to build a mechanism so that the uh, roller coaster would continue on, um, and we also had to create like a pitch. Um, like an advertisement and then a, a video and then a billboard. So there we, it was different for me because I was always like the shy student and I didn't really work with other students. But then these projects have allowed me to really actually have to communicate with these other students and become collaborative, which I've learned that it's actually really important. Um, this past summer I did an internship with Boeing and I really saw that in the workforce, um, yes, it's good to have that knowledge up in your head, but it's better when you're collaborating with everyone and working with everyone to really um, create a project. Yeah. So, so you talk about pathways. I should have asked that question earlier. Um, uh, it sounds like uh, you, you, you've been given a lot of ways to connect the academic work to the workplace yes. um, and to thinking about um, uh, careers. Um, uh, so how do you think the experience you've had uh, will impact your kind of goals for beyond high school? What is, what's on your mind? Well, um, for so when I first came to CAMS, um, so we either have like the engineering pathway or the biotechnology pathway. and all the students are exposed to both, of, well, now they're all exposed to both of them. For me, um, I took the engineering classes. And those engineering classes, something that's really cool is that they're the dual enrollment with um, another community college near our school. So that's really good, like as an incoming freshman, you're already taking these college courses. Um, in addition to that, we also have, I've also taken many math classes. <laughs> which um, I, that was because we're, we're on the campus of Cal State Dominguez Hills, so we're allowed as 11th graders and 12th graders to go and take college courses at the university, which was really different for me because, um, so in high school there's teachers that are telling you, okay, this is your homework, this is what you have to do, here are the notes, these are the notes that you should take, but then in the, in the actual, um, college atmosphere, there's no teacher that will tell you, oh, this is the homework, you know, 
you have to do it. You should spend this ma this um, amount of time for the homework. Don't forget your homework. Uh, these are the notes. You should be taking notes on this, you know? You really get to learn how the college experience is in high school, which I'm really grateful for. Um, now I know that I can go to college and I'll be able to succeed because I've done these college courses um, in a, as a high schooler. We also have the AP classes. So this year, I'm, I'm taking five AP classes. Um, <laughs> um, it's Good job. Good job. Good job. Um, it's allowed me to to learn like the rigor of the courses that that there will be in college, and also like my time management because it's a lot of classes and a lot of work for all of them. So I really have to. I really learned how to manage my time, um, how to study for each courses, um, and yeah, and then as well as the engineering classes that I've taken, there's so many at my school, I'm really glad that there are so that I can see how it is in the actual workforce. Like when I did my internship, um, I was actually glad that because of these classes, I actually knew what people were talking about, about what the engineers were looking at. I could read the same thing that they could, so yeah. Great. Well, wow. that's why we're here. Yeah, <laughs> you bet. That's right. That's why we're here. Um, last but not least is Corinne Cohn, who is the assistant superintendent of Bowie. Correct. Um, all the stuff we've been talking about is. Um, arguably harder to do or sustain if our communities and our parents aren't with us, right? Mm, correct. Right? Oh, yeah. So um, you have these LCAP dinners, what my notes say. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, could you talk about those and just more generally uh, kind of speak to what you've done in Clovis to try to engage parents and community members um, in, your, in your work. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. So um, a little bit about Clovis Unified. So we're located in the Central Valley and we fall somewhere between Chula Vista and Long Beach. We have about 43,000 students that we serve. Um, but with that, we are set up in a similar uh, format maybe to Chula Vista in that we're broken into five comprehensive areas. So we have five comprehensive high schools, um, that have a junior high that feed into them and then a set of elementary schools. So it kind of builds this smaller area within a larger district. Um, and it allows for maybe better partnerships and communication with our parent communities around because um, I'm an assistant superintendent, so I oversee one of the areas and I'm frequently out at school sites and at the parent events so they get a more familiar regular face than our one superintendent hitting uh, 43,000 students and families. Um, so when we had the change, we, that's what we're here for is, you know, the changes that have come and how have we managed through those. Um, with the LCFF, we, um, with the funding formula change, we also enacted the LCAP plan, right, that every district writes. And so our district, um, recognizing that with the supplemental dollars that we were receiving, that, um, you know, need to be focused on our low income, foster youth, homeless, and, um, I'm sorry, and EL students, um, you know, we needed, this was, a, this was a great opportunity in which to engage a community. And as Sabrina alluded, you can't, you, you can't really go out in our world anymore and work in isolation. And that we really needed to leverage the expertise um, that was out there from community members, parents, and our students. So um, right out the gates, we generated this thing called LCAP dinners. And so we meet with our community, the broader community, um, twice a year, um, and we revisit our plan. So in the very beginning, we came together and we didn't really know what that plan was gonna look like, and we generated some open-ended questions of which we, um, we asked for feedback. And it literally was a room probably twice the size, we had about 500 in attendance, and that was um, really a concerted effort to bring diverse perspectives to the table. And at the tables, it's not like parents and administrators. So at these tables, it is parents, students, um, group home managers, um, advocates for foster youth, um, district administrators and site administrators sitting together, discussing 
the data that's presented, how do we make an impact for students? And these broader questions, and it's a sea of big post-its filled with lots of little post-its of ideas. And then we affinity chart those to find general themes, to develop what are gonna be our actions. Um, some great benefits about this LCAP dinner has been that some of the most um, systemic changes have been a result from ideas that came from these tables. So one of the ones that Mr. Burns um, discussed earlier was this transition team. So when we looked at our data, we found that during those transition years from elementary to intermediate school, and then from intermediate school to high school, we tend to lose a good percentage of our at-risk students. So we generated teams that are representative of the um, demographics of each area, um, and those teams build relationships with the students that are identified as at risk in their fifth and sixth grade year, and they follow them to the junior high, and then from that eighth grade year, they follow them to high school to help bridge. We've seen great success in this process. Um, in one year's data, we had um, our identified transition students grow 8% in their GPA. Um, and I think it goes down to relationships, which is what our LCAP dinners are about, engaging and building relationships with our broader community for the betterment of our students. How, how are we doing in terms of the hour I said we'd spend on this? Where would you say we are? We have six more minutes. Wow. Good. Good. So, so what I want to do, we've all heard each other's questions and, and responses, and what I'd like to do right now to see if there are any one or two sort of general observations any of you might have about this uh, work that uh, we're all up to, things I wasn't smart enough to ask you during the um, during the course of our, of our conversation. Anybody could, could jump in. I know if I asked you, Chris, you'd just say more about reading recovery, so I'm gonna start with you. Okay. <laughs> Francisco, any, any Oh, you know, it's, it sounds, you know, the human potential, the relationship is the heart of the matter, mm -hmm. and a real focused relationship on continual learning, and always uh, being vulnerable that you don't know everything, but that the solution is out there, but you have to create structured ways for collaboration to occur. It has to be purposeful. It has to be focused, and, and, and I, I think that by bringing the right people together, uh, you know, we can move mountains. We, we, we can create opportunities for students like her yeah. to succeed and flourish, and I, and, I, and I think we can't lose that, that focus, right? And, and, and I think that, that it shouldn't be an us versus them, it's, but it's all of us together, purposefully, united in the cause and helping our students. You it's know, us I, for we, them. Yeah, I, yeah, right. Really. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. For so long, we've held lots of things constant right. and allowed the uh, learning outcomes to vary widely. And so thinking now about how to vary what we do uh, so that we get less variation in learning outcomes and uh, everybody as happy as, as, as Trina is, I think that's what we really want. Can I add? Yeah. I think it's also really important to note that you have to be very intentional about right. your decisions and the way that you look at data and thinking about moving for equity and finding ways to create those opportunities so that all students have those opportunities. So I think about things that, for example, that happen at Long Beach, like all of our students have access free to take uh, the PSAT and the SAT on our campus, which allows us to have the data to look at students that have the potential to succeed in, say, an AP course, um, but maybe they're students that wouldn't choose those classes on their own, and so then that onus is on us as the leaders to look at that data, to identify students that maybe historically haven't been really represented in those AP courses, um, in those opportunities to do the dual enrollment, to go out and do these, in these internship opportunities, and to 
really just be very intentional about looking at where our gaps are and digging into that information that really is available to us to identify students and to encourage them to pursue these opportunities. Because I think when we look at our data and look at you know, the studies really about um, our un historically underrepresented groups being successful, it's that, that, doesn't, you know, that doesn't happen by chance or by accident. That's very intentional work that um, you know, the onus is on us to look at that data, to seek out those opportunities, and to create those opportunities for our students. Yeah, thank you. You know, I was going to save this question for the end, but I'm going to ask it now. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I'm curious what state or county supports uh, have been available to any of you or that have mattered the most. Um, you know, we've got policymakers, um, you know, in the room. It would be wonderful to to hear about uh, which of those have been particularly helpful uh, in supporting or advancing the work that you, you've done. Yeah, the restructure, <clears throat> the restructure with the LCAP money, I think has been fabulous for, for districts to um, control what their community wants. Um, it gives us a lot more flexibility than what we had before with the categorical program. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to say is is with our teachers, they're definitely in the trenches and they need all the support that we can give them as leadership. They have a very, very difficult job. And so that, that has always been my number one criteria is how can I support my teachers and take every, what can, how can I support them and make time for them and to focusing on student achievement. I'd like to respond. Um, the state superintendent talked a lot about um, LCFS and giving uh, control. Our superintendent spends a lot of time at the state level talking about adequate funding. And um, in order to make good on our promise to all of our students, particularly our students who are typically or historically underperforming, we need to ensure that we have that adequate funding. So a lot of her time and energy goes into um, advocating not just for the students in our, our district, but for advocating for students across the state to ensure that we get adequate funding uh, to make good on our promises for kids. Can I ask, as a core district, I know we're about to wrap up, that has been a huge resource for our district is to be a part of the core district here in the state and to have access to other large urban districts and their data and looking at best practices that are happening at even the at this booth group here and having access to the best practices that are out there. Thank you. Bridget, any? You know, the LCFF was a game changer for Hawthorne because now, you know, teachers were doing all this work for free. We were collaborating after hours and nothing validates a teacher more than saying your time is worthy. And with the LCFF funding, we could pay them to collaborate after school. We could. We could pay them for the intellectual deep thinking that they must do to collaborate together. And I think that we are very grateful to the state because now we have literacy coaches to help us. We have the collaboration time, we have planning time, and without the freedom of LCFF, we would still be doing all of that for free. Uh, for free. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're about done and I need to describe what we're gonna do next. However, Sabrina, do you have any advice for us? <laughs> um, I, I think it's really great what you guys are uh, doing right now and just really focusing on like the students and how you're, you're seeing us from like our perspective, how we, something like us students, like we didn't know, like you guys recognize that we would work together more like as a team effort. And I really think that that's, really amazing that no, more of that is being seen now and you should continue. Thank you, thank you, we'll, we'll heed that advice, we'll heed it. All right, uh, first of all, my panel has done a lot of work, they have tolerated me uh, for, for you know, a better part of an hour and I think we ought to give them, we're not done with them yet, but we ought to give them a round of applause. They did a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I need all the encouragement I can get. Yeah, let's give a hand to the facilitator. <laughs> Great job. Well done. 
I think I know how to talk about what we're getting ready to do. Let me give it a shot, um, but um, we'll see what, uh, how this goes. We're going to give our panelists a short break um, and your facilitator a break, um, but there should be instructions on each of your tables that will help guide the conversations you're about to have. Um, but in a nutshell, what we want you to do now is take about the next 10, 15 minutes, thank you for the extra five minutes, appreciate that, um, to talk at your tables about uh, both what you heard and what you would like to ask the panel when we pull them back together. Uh, then we want you to pick someone at your table to put that question, the single most important question you have, into the online platform. I don't know what the online platform <laughs> is. But, but there's one. But there is one. There, there, is there one? Here comes the boss. Is there one? Yeah, you want mine? Uh, you take mine, I, you know, you'll have to keep it. Here we go. No take backs. Okay, so the most important thing is for you to sit with your colleagues and actually have a discussion about what you think are the most important questions we want to ask the panelists up here. Then there is this little technical thing that there's a one, of, one person at the table will log on to slido.com and there's piece of paper on your table that uh, describes it. I've done this before at other meetings as a participant. I've never run one uh, at slido.com. And there's a code, you put it in, and you're going to be able to put your number in there. So someone at the table who feels technologically secure um, should, uh, should take, take that one on. Kent, if you're at a table, don't you be the pe person. <laughs> um, <coughs> in 20 minutes, and we'll actually um, ask, the, ask the folks the questions, okay? So go ahead and get started, and maybe we'll circulate around and make sure that people know how to do it. And it works, and we've got the, got, so we're gonna go back to work now. Um, and I think the process, I sure hope I can unlock this phone. I know they're on the screen, right? But there's more questions on her phone that we get to and I'm gonna look at them, there we go. Um, the process The process works. And panel, we have um, a few really good questions uh, to field. We have, I would say, what do we have, 15 minutes, something like that, to do this work. So let's get started. Um, uh, and the audience can now see these questions, but I'll read them uh, you know, for us. Uh, the highest vote getter was the following. Um, describe the development of your culture and key strategy that has allowed for collaboration, cross-site learning, and calibration, and the scaling of best practice. Give you guys a second to ponder that question and um, I won't volunteer you unless, because the other thing I learned in that first class I taught is that I have poor wait time. <laughs> and so I can't handle silence for too long. I'll start coming after uh, people. But describe the development of your culture uh, and key strategy that has allowed for the kind of collaboration uh, uh, 
uh, that you've enjoyed in your career. Does anybody want to jump in on that? Sorry. I think that it highlights, I heard it in a couple of different answers actually, and it was introduced at the beginning, was it starts really for our district in our hiring process. So our interviews are extensive. It, a candidate can go from four to seven interviews. They work from a site panel on up all the way through our superintendent who hires every teacher and administrator. But in that process, it's more than just um, getting to know the candidate, it's also our onboarding. It's where we start talking about the culture of our school. We start really embodying the thing that everybody said about vision with all students. One of our strategic aims is maximize, students, maximize learning for all students. And this is our opportunity as the candidates progress through to really start empowering them what the expectation and the culture of our district is and how we believe in collaboration so that they have a good understanding when they come in and before they sign their contract in that final interview. Is this a place that really resonates with their core values? Is it a good fit for them as well as it is for us as a district? Chris, you wanna add to that at all? Yeah, um, I would say, of course, trust is key. Um, for you to give your educators the freedom to try different experiences in the classroom, um, given that, that time for them to collaborate and to discuss best practices and to look at student data. That's, that's where the rubber really hits the road for us. So we, um, they will bring their data in and we will look at it and even work samples of students and then, especially writing, they'll, they'll be looking at those and everybody's reading each other's and so like we have nine teachers, I said, at that grade level. And then they start asking like, well, how did you get your kids to perform? How did you get them to do that? So just building those trustful relationships will take you a long ways. Um, Francisco, you, you guys are from bigger right. districts. Right. Um, this term scale might mean something. Mm -hmm. you know, right. How do you, uh, get something started and then kind of systematically move it across the, the district. I think it's really important is how you structure, you know, the conversation, and 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 having, even though we're we're large, having small pockets of conversation structured around a focus is very significant, and also the type of people that we bring around the table. I mean, it's so critical that you have. Uh, voices from many different mm -hmm. perspectives, from the parent perspective, student perspective, the union perspective, uh, the uh, leader perspective, the board perspective as well. And I, and, I, and I think it's really critical that you become an architect on how you collaborate. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important. Uh, San Diego has had similar um, to Chula Vista, the idea of learning cycles and our superintendent, um, when she first started, launched uh, four learning cycles. And the first two um, are very aligned to this particular question. It was, um, how do we build classroom cultures worthy of our students? So we talked about um, mindset, but also physical space. And then the second learning cycle was around collaborative conversations. And so those two learning cycles, and, and there were a total of four, but can you imagine an entire district that serves over 100,000 students all focused in on particular inquiry questions, focused on culture for a period of time, and then they shift to collaborative conversations. So you have an entire system where when area superintendents are visiting classrooms and um, we're looking for opportunities for, that kids have to talk, and then we're also looking at opportunities where teachers have that planning time that you talked about. Um, so that's, that's an example of scalability in a really large system. Let me move to the second question with the highest vote. Um, how can a district begin to enhance teacher preparation? professional development and support. How would you pay for it and scale it? Any ideas in particular for small districts and or districts who aren't proximate to college? First of all, they have to, they have to listen to the teachers. The PD has to be driven, the training has to be driven by what teachers need what they want 
Um, and by that I mean, what are they missing? What support do they need? Teachers know what's not working. Mm -hmm. But then they need to be able to communicate with their admin, their district leadership to say, we need help with this. And it needs to be not punitive, you're not getting it done, but okay, how can we help you? And that's the way the PD has to start. And I think the way you pay for it is through your LCFF funding. I see, I see. You, you had to have done that with uh, these professional learning cycles, couldn't have built them without teacher input, oh, right? Oh, teacher input is, is exceedingly important because you know, we, we not only at a consultation level when our district office personnel meet, meets with the union, but also uh, in every single site in, with the instructional learning teams, within every single site, that conversation is really important because when you think about a, a, the, our instructional focus, which is language development, well, how does that work in a school that's right next to the border? Right? How does that work in a school with 30, 40% with the military population? So every, every school has this unique culture within a large culture, right? So how do we take a focus where it meets the needs of individual schools at, at the same time as meeting the needs of the district? So that, that two-way two collaboration from a district level to a school level centered on teachers' needs and the knowledge that they have of the culture of the school and the needs of the students. And that, that, that's, an, that's an integral. So I'm a recovering dean. Okay. Okay, <laughs> like four years of recovery for every year of service. Um, you mentioned teacher ed in Long Beach mm -hmm. as a part of the pipeline work. Now speak to the teacher preparation or teacher education part of this program. Sure. I think similar to what Francisco was just talking about is really kind of tapping into our, just the knowledge that we have. I like to say that the answer is always in the room when we're together in a PD with teachers, with, uh, with the whole district and our leaders is that the answers are here in the room. And so we have a collaborative inquiry visits process on, on, in our district where um, we visit, and this was part of the report, where you visit, um, you have like sister schools, two to three schools that go and visit each other and look for those four, four understandings, those really best practices, and sort of identify um, these great things that teachers are doing because there are a lot of outliers in our own schools that are just outperforming um, the rest of their colleagues, and you really want to tap into those resources. And so that's really a system that we have built in, in Long Beach is identifying a really strong teacher that is doing incredible things and then tapping those teachers to help put on some professional development or be a part of those visits and have other schools come and see some of these best practices and then we'll be then we're going around to different schools and we're paying for that through LCFF funding through uh, district allocated funding so that we're able to to put put that knowledge that we have there at, at the district to good use and to share those best practices around the district. So it's not just happening at one school and, and teachers are teaching other teachers at their schools, but it's happening across the district. And we're um, using that. We also have a platform um, in our district. So we have this, um, this way of um, finding those great teachers that are doing these incredible things in, uh, around the district and uh, recording them and doing a video and then uploading on our platform so our teachers are able to go. And so it's not always possible to take teachers across the district to other schools, but it is possible for a teacher during um, PD time at your school or your allocated meeting times to watch those videos and get some ideas and work with their grade level team. And um, so really kind of just looking at the resources that we already have built into the district rather than. Well, I'm going to come back to that um, resource question in a second sure. and give everybody a chance to speak to it. But I can't resist asking you, Sabrina, what, uh, what's your, when do you know that your teacher is prepared? I feel when they're teaching, like you can feel like their confidence in what they're doing. Like it's, I don't know how to explain it. You just kind of like, like, like for me, like there's some teachers where I'm just like, okay, yeah, I, I know what they're doing. Like I'm totally confident. Like I don't have anything to worry about. It's the way they like 
show themselves, I guess, kind of. Um, like the way, like the way they teach, it's, it's not like they're looking at their book or like, it's kind of like they're, like they magically like remember <laughs> everything, like they just know what they're saying. I guess it's kind of how I know like, like they're doing good, like that's how they're Right, teaching. they know their stuff. Yes. Uh, they're passionate about it. Um, and they... Uh, and they have like many activities as well that they do. Um, that's how I know like, like when they have something planned for us and it's really like hands on and they're 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 like helping us kind of I, I don't know how to explain it but you you can see in a teacher when yeah. you know like those things. perfect answer um, we're nearly out of time I'm gonna go to uh, my version of the third question um, which would be to say this um, um, all of us could use more resources, right? Um, and I'm sure you have uh, a, a sense of what you do, you know, with the next uh, resource you, you've got. I'd like to ask each of you in the name of proving, improving student learning um, uh, to speak to two things. Um, what would you do if you had um, another uh, dollar, um, and how are you thinking about the reallocation of the resources you have uh, in order to get the most out of the improvement strategy uh, that you're pursuing? Let's just start with Chris and just come right down the I'd reduce the class size. Okay. Reduce class size. For us, it would be definitely to um, invest in social emotional learning. We find that um, we have a lot of students that have serious emotional needs. Um, and, and you would, sometimes you think it's the, the underperforming kids, but we have kids in our system who are high achieving, and if you're just looking at their GPA or their grades, you don't know the trauma that they're experiencing. And so we look at social emotional well-being for all of our kids and um, for all of our staff, actually. We've launched a lot of work. Our superintendent has been um, truly inspirational in this idea that um, social emotional well-being is important for an entire system. I would provide more hands-on learning opportunities for the kids. Like, remember when we used to get to do field trips mm -hmm. and bring in different assemblies where they crawled in and looked at the light, the stars, and mm -hmm. we brought in the frontier days for fourth and fifth grade. I would bring some of those real experiences back to school. All right, if I had an extra dollar, obviously mental health services is mm -hmm. really critical. I, I, and not, not only for the student, but really for the adults as well. I mean, it's, it's very difficult um, being an educator nowadays. And something that, that Tony talked about also is the affordability aspect with housing. I mean, it, it, if I had uh, some extra revenue or figure out a way for 100% of my teachers to live within, within my community and, and make it affordable, because I want our teachers, if, if, we expect every child is an individual great worth. We want to make sure our teachers feel the, the same way. So how do we offer a vibrant workplace you know, for our teachers? I mean, yeah. I get to see how Google takes care of their employees, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they offer breakfast, they, it's stimulating. They offer even vacation. If you stay there for, uh, at Google for a year, you get to take a one week vacation. I mean, they do things that are pretty outrageous, but people want to go there. I want my teachers to want to be at my district, right? So how do I, how do I create that environment, right? I would love to do that if I had that extra dollar. It, it would definitely be to continue to invest in our teachers in the professional development that they receive from the onslaught. It's, it's very, it's, it's common for teachers to get the PD and get into the classroom and then 
kind of on your own and you get different preps and you get different grade levels and, um, and a lot of times teachers are left to figure it out and so that continuous PD that I think our district provides, I would continue to invest in that. I think that is where um, you know, the teachers are going to make the biggest impact on our students and building that co collective teacher efficacy we know makes a huge impact on student learning and so I think that's where if I had extra dollars I'd invest it in the teachers and their PD. Apart from tuition for college, Sabrina, do you have any <laughs> um, I, I agree with like helping like the teachers because I feel that when a student sees that the teacher isn't like well prepared or they don't have like um, they're not pulling putting their all into it, that's where your students tend to like lose interest as well. That's so right. I, I do believe like the strong um, like the teacher is kind of like the root of, of it all to help us grow. So I <laughs> I do believe that good it ha there has to be like a good teacher with like a good foundation for us to really feed off of that energy and really mm -hmm. help us grow as well. I'll echo a lot of what was said. I think it's the so uh, social emotional supports, but I think it's preparing our teachers for that. They're on the front line in the classrooms working with our students and equipping them with the resources and the skill set to meet uh, the increased need we're seeing in the teams that uh, we're working with every day. Well, we're after doing such a good job of being ahead of the clock, I have now put us behind it. Um, and that means I don't get to give you the, the last 10 minute speech that I had planned to, <laughs> to, to, to offer, but Corinne, Sabrina, Wendy, Francisco, Bridget, Sophia, and Chris, I have enjoyed myself up here asking you questions and I'm pretty sure the audience has enjoyed your thoughts uh, as, as well and I want to thank all of you for the work you're doing in the district. Thank and you. Time to spend with us, uh, this thank you. So Patrick, you're in your hand. Thank you. Hello and welcome back. I hope you were able to grab your sandwiches and get something to eat. Feel free, obviously, to continue eating, but in order to stay on time and get you out of here on time, we want to make sure that we uh, get moving with the second afternoon panel. And so now this is the panel where we move from the practitioners to the policymakers and talk about what can be done in Sacramento and, and, uh, and elsewhere. So um, this panel is going to be moderated um, by Vernon Billy. Um, and you know Vernon, who is the CEO and executive director of the California School Boards Association. Um, after his time in the US Air Force, Vernon took on a different kind of service, advocating for districts and students, and working closely with a variety of leaders to advance education policy. Given his long experience in education, we're excited to have him here leaving, leading the next conversation, where we'll be hearing from leading policymakers to discuss the implications of the work you've heard so far from the practitioners. Please join me in welcoming Vernon and the panelists. Okay, all right, I think we got everybody here. Good afternoon, everyone. Come on, you guys gotta wake up. Good af come on, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, all right, that's much better. Um, so I'm excited uh, to be here uh, uh, moderating this panel, I think, with um, my illustrious colleagues here. Um, what I'd like to do first is um, just go down the line here and have you uh, briefly introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your organization. I'm Matt Nava, uh, work for West Ed. I was former superintendent at Sanger Unified School District where I spent 19 years of my career there. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Armolino. I'm the executive director for the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence, CCEE. And we advise and assist and work with county offices and other districts and folks to help them on the academic side. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Dixon Sandy. I'm the executive director of the Commission on Teacher Credentialing. 
Good afternoon, Wes Smith, the Executive Director of the Association of California School Administrators. Um, honored to be a part of this great panel. Uh, good afternoon, I'm David Goldberg, the Vice President of the California Teachers Association and a third generation educator from Los Angeles. Great, thank you. All right, well, let's jump right into this and um, I wanna direct the first question to Matt. Um, so the previous panel did a great job of highlighting uh, what has been working in their districts. Uh, we all heard about the great work that they're doing. Uh, you were the former superintendent at uh, Sanger uh, School District. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Sanger and describe um, what you were able to do to achieve steady improvement for your highest need students, um, particularly English language learners and students with disabilities? Sure. So um, when I arrived in Sanger, it was 1999. And for those of you that don't know the story of Sanger, it's a, it's a pretty incredible story. Uh, we are the gateway to the giant sequoias. And so we were anointed by the US Post Office as the nation's Christmas tree city, for those of you that don't know. And in 1999, when you drove into the town of Sanger, you saw the welcome to Sanger, nation, home of the nation's uh, Christmas tree city. And you also saw the sign that said, welcome to Sanger, home of 400 unhappy teachers. And that sign stood for about two years. And I was intrigued by uh, two things. One, a group of educators that felt that that was the only way to voice their frustration with the system. And two, a city that tolerated it. A city that, whose only identity was being the nation's Christmas tree city, and yet that, that sign stood in partnership with that signal to all visitors who came to that small town. We went through, uh, it didn't take me long when I got there to realize that there was a lot of systemic, uh, below ground level, below sea level frustration in that, that community and in that district. But about 2007, 2004, things started to come together and we really were able to take the fog away from the system in such a way that we focused on three things. Um, that really built the backbone or the umbrella of our MTSS system without us knowing we were building our multi-tiered system of support. We really anchored ourselves to an educational framework that all, everyone could articulate, that was uh, highly focused on the best practices we could use to empower our struggling learners and those students that needed more support. We focused on building a response to intervention model that, we, that could be trans translated from school to school, and we focused on building a collaborative culture in our system. And those three initiatives are the same three initiatives now that were back when we established them in 2004. The same three goals, the same three initiatives. And Jane, David and Joan Talbert did a study of Sanger. They wanted to know if you took the model that Sanger had and translated it to another district, would it work? And what do you think they found? Yes and no. <laughs> Context matters for districts. And in, for our district, we were at a particular time where those three initiatives aligned and allowed us to focus on our most at-risk students in such a way that we could pull away some of the frustration. And we were able to catalyze the underbelly of our system, which is really the identity uh, of the organization, the way information was exchanged and the connections that fed the system that was developing the systems, strategies, structures, and processes. And so oftentimes what we were doing is we were focusing above and it was the underbelly that was undercutting everything that we were doing. And so once we were able to anchor to the three pieces of work, we were able to get some work done. Excellent, so let's build off of that looking at, at the state level. So um, we've, in the last few years we've had um, the local control funding formula um, was implemented. We've had other initiatives uh, like the California MTSS, mm -hmm. uh, the English Learner Roadmap, uh, just to name a few. Um, what are some of the state policy opportunities that could continue building on these types of initiatives so that districts can continue lifting up all students, uh, especially the ones that, that we just, you just referenced earlier? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the state is doing some great work right now. I think there's some excellent work between CDE and CCE coming out with the 21st century CSLA and the Workforce Investment Grant. But I will tell you for us, MTSS for many people, they don't realize that that 
that initiative for the state of California came out of the Special Education Task Force report published in 2013. And many people question why that came out of the Special Education Task Force report, but we pushed that initiative because we believed that that initiative, if, if it was translated and transcend across the district, that it could be used to support all students, mostly uh, with an emphasis on supporting students with disabilities. What we didn't do well was preparing, we didn't have the preparation to make that work the way that it was envisioned that it would work. So I think in terms of policy where we have to put some attention and give some attention is earlier in our teacher prep and our administrative prep programs. We have to prepare people and educators that are coming into the workforce that understand what MTSS means so that it doesn't get translated like we did initially, that MTSS is nothing more than response to intervention and we're already doing that. There was, a, there was a vision from that task force that was asking for more, more from the system in terms of the way it responded. Sanger had backed its way into that not knowing what it was creating and created an infrastructure where the system was aligned from boardroom to classroom around the same data markers. So we didn't have schools analyzing any different data that the board wasn't analyzing. We kept the system coherent. But what we didn't have as the educators came into the system was we had teachers come in ill-prepared to support students with disabilities, ill-prepared to support students with, that needed language supports and interventions and scaffolds. We had administrators that we were building our own, but we were building our own with our own knowledge base. We weren't really expanding their understanding of what it was beyond our walls. And so if we can spend some time in policy there, I think we can really get in front of the, some of the issues we're having. The other one is the other initiative that hasn't received a lot of attention is UDL. Universal Design for Learning was the other initiative that was called out in the Special Education Task Force report in 2013. That's gotten little attention. Yet that is probably the backbone of this whole infrastructure, is an instructional framework that all teachers can use to create access for all students. And the Special Education Task Force report called that out clearly. UDL, under the umbrella of an MTSS framework, will facilitate an educational infrastructure that provides supports and resources to students that they need. UDL hasn't received a lot of attention. It hasn't been called out. It's been called locally under local control. Those districts that feel like they're ready, they take it on. I will tell you that with UDL, what I've experienced in my work, no one's ready to take that on. It's a much heavier lift than people think, but it's necessary. Thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to shift over to, to Tom Armolino, the executive director of the CCE, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, Tom, the LCFF and LCAP, and we heard a little bit about that in, in the previous panel, um, that was an important change for districts and the state um, and may have helped set the stage for, for different types of innovation at the, at the local level. As California continues, to, continues building out its statewide system of support, um, which you're leading, uh, over the next several years, how, how can we identify best practices that districts have been developing and, and then spread them uh, statewide. And I, and I just want, I want to add a little something else to this question. And we always talk about best practices, but what about promising practices? Mm -hmm. And thinking of it in those terms. And I'd like to see what you think about that. Yeah, well, thank you for that lens, too. I appreciate that. You hear me OK? Looks like my mic. There we go. I, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Gelling Hammond and her team yes. for the work that they've done today in the outlier report is an example, I think, of, I know when I first came into this role, I went across the state and met with a lot of folks and talked to them about what are some things that we can do to uh, make sure that we're supporting the needs of students. And folks talked about, we need examples. We need examples of folks who are doing the work with kids that look like my kids. I think this is an example of some of the work uh, that's been going on in the state where folks are doing some great work. One thing I think about the LCAP and in the, uh, the dashboard in particular is it calls out the needs of various student groups that maybe those needs were not called out in the past. Mm -hmm. It's brought attention to those to where focus, folks are more focused, I think, directly on making sure that they're trying to reduce some of those equity gaps. And so I think there's really some great work that's out there. We had the experience in our organization where we were very fortunate that the state funded us to do some work with what we call our pilot partnership districts. It was a group of districts across the state, uh, various sizes of the groups, both rural and urban, and. Uh, some larger and some small districts, and in particular, it gave us an opportunity to work with them 
alongside the superintendent with a leadership team that involves some teachers and school administrators and some other stakeholders to really dig in, do some work together. And what was unique about that work is, is that it was focused on continuous improvement, so we were using all the strategies around continuous improvement and improvement science, but it gave them an opportunity to learn from each other as well. So they were able to sit in the room, and we were specific about making sure that they had that opportunity. And so you saw some partnerships where folks were, they were learning, but then they were also learning together. And that work has actually is, has really had uh, an impact on our work. And some of our work that we've had to do with some of the districts that are in fiscal distress across the state, we've used some of what we've learned there as we've gone into those districts uh, to make sure that we can go ahead and kind of hit the ground running and learning from some of that work. In addition to that, there are, I think professional learning networks is a key to our work. What's unique about the system of support is, is that it's a system of support where it's intended for groups of people to work together. And I've shared this in the past, our systems are really set up pretty independent, right? Most of us in our systems where we've worked, I know when I was a school teacher, I worked independently in my classroom. I might have worked a little bit with my colleagues, but most of the time it was, it was on my own. When I became a school principal, very similar, it was my school, I focused on my school, my district, I focused on my district. System of support says, let's open our doors and figure out how we can learn from each other, right? So both across various agencies, so excited about these opportunities that are out there. I think the community engagement initiative that we're working on now, it identifies some districts that have already been doing some great work around some of these subgroups. It's giving them the resources to be able to then look at how we can scale those across the state. I think some of the new work around, uh, as uh, uh, Matt mentioned too, in particular around the Educator Workforce Grant and CSLA, those now we're getting at some level one resources that we can really uh, support the system as it moves forward. So thank you for that. So looking 10 years uh, forward into the future, how do you envision the statewide system of support, both in how it's organized and how it will uh, serve as a resource to districts? Yeah, I can't wait for that time. That's going to be an exciting time, <laughs> You'll still too. be here, right? Yeah, you're gonna, you're not going to retire we'll yet. Right? That's right. All right. <laughs> how can you let go of this? It's, it's an exciting time in education. It really is. Um, I know just in my, my last years of experience, is I've been blown away with the opportunity that folks have taken to work together, that people are really making efforts. And it really starts with the leadership of our state board and our governor in particular. Our state board developed an accountability system that's called the system of support, right? Who does that, right? A lot of folks are watching what we're doing. The old systems were all built on, right, around this punishment piece, this reward at one time, built around a single score. Right now we have multiple assessments, we have local assessments, we have local opportunities to look at the needs, and it gives folks some autonomy and ability to use their resources where they feel like they're really needed. That's extremely unique. Agencies like ours was developed, right, to be a resource and a support to other folks too. I think the piece that where our current system is, you know, we're still growing a little bit, is it's, it's pretty heavily focused right now around level two or differentiated assistance, right? It's around when folks, you know, are first being identified, as needing some of the possible other resources. I think where we're going around level one resources, in particular around some of the new work, as I mentioned, with bringing CSLA back, mm -hmm. bringing the Educated Workforce Investment Grant. We need more resources at the level one level, right? And so that we're able to kind of across the state make sure that folks can be more proactive, right? And have the resources that they need, especially around professional development. I think, as I mentioned, professional learning networks are key to the work, right? And actually being able to infuse money and opportunities for folks to learn from each other, put them in a room together and talk about ways that they can improve and learn from each other as they're doing that. There's some real opportunity. The other idea of coaching, I think there are lots of opportunities, there are reports, there are various things out there of what we can do to get better, but folks actually need a little bit of help with that. Mm -hmm. right? So being able to have some more mentoring and being able to give the ability for folks at the local level to have the resources they need and the coaching they need to actually put those implementation, I think will make a big difference. Great. So in the last panel, there was a, a common thread that I think we all picked up on, and that related to the importance of teachers mm -hmm. um, and, and the efforts of the districts to uh, not only to attract the teachers, but to retain teachers and develop them and provide that professional learning um, that, that we all know that teachers need and, and, and want. Uh, recently, the state has made a number of investments um, to help districts with those efforts. Um, but I think we could all probably agree there's more work to be done. Um, so I want to 
turn the next question over to the person who has all the answers on this <laughs> issue. I know she does, Mary. <laughs> um, from, from the seat that she sits in at the CTC, which is a very important body um, for the work that all of us are doing. So I, I wanna ask you, what progress have you seen? Um, what are the key barriers to teacher recruitment that um, your organization sees that exist right now, or that continue to exist? And uh, what do you think can be done to help address them? And yes, that was more than one question. <laughs> so. Thank you for the question, and I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. I, I think there are some encouraging signs. Uh, for one thing, we've seen steady, though not gigantic, but steady increases in teacher enrollment. Uh, in the 17-18 in the year, we had 25,000 teachers enrolled in teacher preparation. That's a good sign, and that was up from the prior five years. So, so that's moving in the right direction. Um, we've also seen slow but steady increases in the numbers of credentials we're issuing. So in the 17-18 year, when 25,000 teachers were enrolled in teacher ed, about 12,000 of them came forward and got credentialed. So about 50% of them, of that cohort came forward. Another 4,000 teachers came into California from another state. So we had about 16,000 new teachers coming in in the 17-18 year. Unfortunately that year, uh, about 26,000, or the prior year, about 26,000 teachers, according to data in one of the reports on your table, left the teaching profession. So we're almost but not quite holding steady there, which is a bit of a challenge. The, the investment in the last several years in teacher recruitment has been significant, and I think it's a very important sign that we are we're trying to take the problem on head on. $200 million has have, have been run through my agency into grants to local education agencies and higher education institutions to address this. So one of those is a key infrastructure investment, $10 million to build undergraduate pathways uh, for individuals who would like to complete a degree and a credential in four years. Uh, we funded 41 of those institutions. They're together uh, putting about 85 different pathways in place right now and enrolling their first cohorts. Um, we are expecting and hoping to see as many as 1,500 teachers come through these new pathways over the next several years. Uh, so that's a hopeful development. The Center for Teaching Careers was funded. That created the CaliforniaTeach.org virtual um, job fairs and the, the web-based portal that's creating statewide support and access for teachers who'd like to move, or want to be teachers, candidates who might want to move into teaching. The classified grant program, $45 million to attract uh, people who are serving in our schools already and living in our communities already, a very diverse population of, of staff who would like to become teachers. We expect to see about 2,200 or more classified staff make it into the teaching ranks in the next few years. The local solutions grants, $50 million set aside for local decisions about how can we best get the special education and STEM teachers we need. Um, most of that, 71% of the, of the districts that got these funds spent it on tuition support, service scholarship kinds of things to help allay the costs of getting a credential. Uh, other things they supported were signing bonuses and training for mentors because mentoring and induction is key to retention. And then finally, teacher residencies, $75 million invested in yet another, I think, very important part of our infrastructure in California that should create as many as 3,700 uh, seats for residents in special education and in STEM over the next few years. That's an exciting community that's coming together to think about how we prepare teachers alongside veteran, excellent teachers in our schools. Um, very exciting moment for us. I'm also very encouraged by the 2019 budget, the 37 million in workforce investment funds because the veteran workforce really needs some support out there, yes? <laughs> yes, they do. Um, funding for the subject matter projects, I think some of the best professional development we have out there, that we saw some increases there. The restart of the uh, California School Leadership Academy, uh, also leaders are in desperate need of opportunities to work together and that's also an important investment. I think most important for the, uh, the ongoing recruitment issue, however, is the $90 million set aside for the Golden State Teacher Grant Program focused on service scholarships, um, and, and, and that sort of program. When I talk to superintendents, they tell me the thing that they think would most help uh, is if there was some kind of uh, funding stream to support service scholarships and forgivable loans. So we're doing things along those lines. The challenge, however, as I mentioned before, 25,000 enrolled 
in 17, 18, uh, 26,000 left the prior year, 8,000 seats were filled by emergency permit holders. Things that we need to do, I think, to, to try to stable this are not, include not treating these investments as one-time investments. Um, if we're going to actually make a dent in this situation, we need to make a steady uh, kind of focused plan to do so. Thank you. So and, and the next question, you, you kind of touched on this, and I'm, but let's explore this a little bit more. Um, it's, it's been said that just keeping teachers in the profession um, would go a long, a long way towards eliminating the shortage. Um, you just laid out some very, I think, startling and important statistics uh, about the, the teacher shortage. What can, what can we do to help districts develop and retain their teachers? Well, I, I think first and foremost, nobody wants to go into a job that they're not prepared for or that they're doing poorly, especially, and they're not gonna stay in a job where they don't feel like they can do it, especially a high stakes job like teaching. So preparation is absolutely paramount. And, and we've been doing some things, Matt, I'm, I, we're gonna have to talk some more after all of this because I'd like to brief you on the things we're doing to get MPSS into the preparation screen for every teacher and every administrator coming into teaching and leading uh, right now. New standards, new assessments, uh, a very significant shift in the way we prepare both teachers and leaders. New focus on social emotional learning across both those populations. New focus on student-centered teaching and learning. New focus on UDL. Every single teacher who completes a California teaching performance assessment will have to use UDL to, de to design a lesson and then a series of lessons. They have to be able to use assessment data uh, that they collect from their one-on-one -on -one assessments, their checking for understanding, their standardized assessments in their classes to determine who's this working for, Who's it not working for? And how do I adapt instructionally to bring everybody forward? Brand new and aggressive focus, I would say, on inclusion that's part of the MTSS uh, effort. I, I continually meet people who talk to me about MTSS as if it's a special ed program. And mm -hmm. I wanna argue the point, it is not a special ed program. It is one of the most important ways that we are redesigning the structure of schooling and I think I totally agree with you, UDL is central to that, understanding the outcomes and planning forward, that's what every educator needs to do. That said, the 12,000 teachers we prepared in California represent about 1% of the existing workforce, and so it's gonna take us a little time <laughs> to get the new population uh, kind of to, to critical mass in, in the workforce, but we're on it and we're working on it and we really need to work together across our higher education institutions and our schools and school districts and, school and, uh, and county offices of education to see this as a partnership for change. That's really quite critical. Um, I, I can't say enough, and I, I can't even begin to say as much as has been said already about the importance of school culture and the focus we have to maintain and aggressively maintain on school leadership. We've overhauled the preparation for school leaders. We've built a new performance assessment for them that privileges three things. First of all, the analysis of data, the development of equity gap analyses, and the, the thinking through and the reflection on what are the implications of an equity gap for my practice as a school leader. Secondly, uh, organizing communities of practice amongst teachers to work on real problems of practice that are occurring right here in this context. And third, working on instructional coaching. Uh, those are three very important things that go to the job of principaling, among many, many others, but we think we're really going to begin to shift the culture of the incoming principal workforce, of which there were about 3,000 this year. Well, 3,000 people completed preparation this year. Again, this is a workforce that needs some stimulation to grow in order to get the leadership that we need in our schools, but from the preparation end, we, we've been paying attention to the research and to the, the direction of all of the reform that's underway in California. And I think these are some of the ways in which we're gonna create stable schools in which teachers want to work and in which leaders want to work. And the outliers that we studied today and heard from today have some very important things to show us about how you do this mechanically and culturally and systemically. Uh, and that's, that's a message for all of us. Thank you, all right. So I want to, uh, at this point, shift uh, just a little bit the conversation to uh, the, uh, the folks up here who represent uh, organization, membership organizations, um, specifically to, to, to Wes and, and to David. 
Um, so the positive outliers report uh, emphasized the importance of establishing a shared district vision that brings stakeholders together around a common set of goals. Uh, many of the positive outlier districts describe a high level of co collaboration among teachers, school and, and district administrators. What does this finding mean for your members? Specifically, what are the conditions that are needed to support this type of activity, this work? Yeah, me first? Absolutely. Okay. I, I <laughs> just don't want to get that red sign. Um, first, thanks to LPI for sitting me next to uh, David. Um, not because it's CTA, I sit by CTA all the time for the last seven years, but I haven't felt this short since my senior prom. So, um, <laughs> thanks, guys. Um, it, yeah, I, I, I think first off, we, we have to talk about the, the narrative. We have a narrative that things aren't working and that we can't get along. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really, in all honesty, appreciate the LPI because they're breaking that narrative. This report that Tom mentioned and the work that they're doing, we're demonstrating that this notion that our, our system, um, our administrators, our teachers, and our students are broken is false and it's malicious. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. hyper-politicized. There are reasons why that was there. That reason is no longer here. So how do we change that narrative? And I think uh, examples like that of, of um, promising practices of bright spots, mm -hmm. uh, lifting up where people are working well together. And so I think getting to your question about what can associations do, we can work collaboratively to help people understand how to work together in true collaboration. It's something that you can try to test um, on an exam, but I think until you practice it, uh, what does true collaboration look like? Uh, CTA has been talking with AXA for years, Eric Kynes and I have chatted about um, doing workshops with both of our members on true and meaningful collaboration. And, and what does it look like when we disagree? Uh, it looks like my dinner table almost every night, right? Um, what does listening really look like um, what does uh, mutual consideration, um, what does that look like and how can we be intentional about training? That should be something we do across the state. Um, and then as it relates to governance, having governance structures mm -hmm. that promote true collaboration. Mm -hmm. right? So I think associations can do a much better job of being intentional about training our folks to work together to demonstrate that the only way it can work in fact is if we do it together. Um, that we're working together towards the best interests of students. Um, and then uh, really change the narrative, demonstrating value add, right? Mm -hmm. Value add for our students. Um, seeing them achieve, because they will achieve as we communicate better, as we work better together. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done in that, in that area. And, and look forward to working with CTA and their new leadership to see if we can pull something like that off statewide. LPI can study it then they can bring us back and have a stand up on a stage um, so you can really see the dynamic um, and share what we're doing. David? Uh, so why don't I start where you finish? You hear me? No. Testing, testing, mm -hmm. hear me now? Uh, I think collaboration is absolutely essential. Um, I, I agree with you. In fact, we have the labor management uh, collaboration, which I know some of our locals are uh, involved, which I think is, uh, critical and I also you know I, I do think just reflecting on this report as well which I think is very helpful in the way it, it uh, puts stability mm -hmm. <laughs> way at the forefront of our work and our lens by which we look at it because a lot of we have a thousand locals in CTA and a lot of them most of them I would say are not stable places <laughs> and I think we need to call out that's not by in some ways looking at the outliers is absolutely important I learned a lot just being here and reading the report but I think there's also big systems at play that we also have to call out, right? And I think part of being a third generation educator, my grandmother started teaching LA in the 1930s. <laughs> uh, and we went, you know, in California from first to worst in funding, right? Mm -hmm. we, my grandmother was teaching, we had free UCs, Cal States, community colleges, our K-12 system was the envy of the world. And that changed, and that didn't change by accident, right? And I think we need to bring, I appreciate the way this report brings up race into this analysis, because mm -hmm. it, it became, uh, that was very much part of what happened as well, right? There was a disinvestment in public education. Right. I think we need to, and now we're seeing how schools and communities have been destabilized. And so I think part of our work as union members, first of all, you referenced me as a membership organization, mm -hmm. I think. We have to redefine what it means to be a member of our organization. 
having these kind of, we have 325,000 people who pay us dues. Being a member is having these kind of conversations, right? And I think what we're seeing is when we do have these kind of conversations, we look not just like at the outliers, but also the day-to-day -day for most people's work lives. It allows us, for example, we've seen exciting changes in the way we work around even our contract demands, where our contract demands are no longer in real exciting ways just around salary and health care, but really about the schools our students deserve, right? And we've seen beautiful strikes across this nation, many in California even, which again, which sees our role not just stabilizing our workforce, but also being an important role in stabilizing our communities, our school communities, but even the broader community. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to keep looking at these outliers and keep also asking great questions about why are they outliers? <laughs> what is the system-wide structures that are at play? For us, we're really, we're all on board with, with the Schools and Communities First Initiative next year on the ballot, which is gonna allow us to have these conversations about the disinvestment that's happened over generations and, and put a racial lens on it and really have a real talk about the soul of our California and how we take care of all kids in all communities. Because none of our kids, even outliers, none of our kids are getting the education they deserve. And we need to continue to fight for that. Mm -hmm. So, and David, thank you for that. You, you actually have answered partly the next question. Okay. Uh, but, but feel free to chime in again. In fact, I'd like to, if I can, I'm gonna break the rules a little bit here. Uh, I don't want all of you, I mean, if you feel, if there's something you wanna say on this, on this last question, to please chime in. Um, so along those same lines, what has the state done and what remains to be done uh, to help boost your members' capacity to implement uh, the kinds of practices that we've heard about uh, today. And you just referenced some of that, but if there's more, chime in. Wes and others, please chime in. And I am gonna chime in on this one as well, so. Yeah, so for CTA, we have a number of initiatives that we're taking on, um, including our Instructional Leadership Corps, which we're really trying to train our own members, because when we talk about collaboration, for the most part, education, as educators, it's not always collaborative in general. Mm -hmm. We need, you know, we're one of the only, for example, professions that doesn't control our professional development at this point, right? And that, again, that's not by accident. There's historical reasons for that. And I think part of what we're doing is really preparing our members through our Instructional Leadership Corps, where we've now trained hundreds of people, have done thousands of training to be part of that collaboration. I think statewide, uh, I really appreciate uh, the way that now testing is, uh, is on the verge of being de-emphasized. I gotta continue to push around that, the way that's uh, taken over a lot of our curriculum. I also think uh, we need to continue to figure out ways to uh, make sure that uh, younger students and students of color coming into profession, and the state has, like getting the RECA, getting rid of the RECA, a lot of these mm -hmm. gatekeeper exams and procedures that have kept a lot of amazing jewels of communities out of education is another huge thing mm -hmm. I think the state can be mm -hmm. part of, and CTA look forward to helping be part of that as well. Wes? On the state, we talk about access and opportunity gaps. In my opinion, we have a huge priority gap. Um, our priority ought to be our students, and, and we should prioritize them even more and do so with, with real money, mm -hmm. right? And you talked about the disparity. You hear it all the time. It's depressing. The, the important and uplifting message is there are opportunities to make a real difference, to do things in our career that are legacy activities. Um, the, yes, there's the schools and community, uh, the split role, access supports that. We're co-sponsoring with CSBA uh, about an initiative that gets about triple the money into the system. Um, we ought to all walk to the governor's office after this meeting and say, we demand you and the legislature do a two-thirds vote, bring what's best in schools and community, what's best in full and fair funding, and invest long-term in the 20 billion of dollars in California students so we can end the in institutional historic racism that puts our kids where they are before they even come to us, and the research is clear on that. That's what we have to disrupt if we want to change the system. Even, even about the teacher pipeline. Teacher pipeline, excuse me, uh, I get pre-service training, it's important. It's, it's pre-K where the teacher pipeline fails because our students who are, who are uh, misrepresented, um, who look like their friends, don't have the vocabulary and access to go to college, to go to a pre-service training, and to be a teacher who looks like their students. So we have to start there. Funding isn't everything, but it's just about everything. Mm -hmm. And then the state ought to put money where their mouth is and prioritize the things that are important, like collaboration. It shouldn't be a hobby. 
We should be doing something about that. And governance, Vern, and I, you, you may want to hit on this. Um, we ought to be intentional about it. In my experience, you want to turn around a district to school, have great relationship labor management, have great governance mm -hmm. relationship, period. Everything else will come into play. You don't have those. I don't care how much you know about curriculum and instruction. Why is it that teachers have to have all this training, principals, everyone has to have training, except for the school board members? Who set the policy, for heaven's sake, right? Everybody ought to be well-trained and purposeful, and there ought to be some resources to do that. Sorry. All right. Well, you just took everything that I was going to say, oh, but I'm, now, now I'm going to come oh, up with something else. No, but <laughs> let, let me, let, I, I said I was going to chime in on this one, because, uh, and I agree with uh, everything that uh, David and Wes uh, have said. Um, while money may not be everything, as you said, but in a lot of ways it is, to be able to do a lot of the things that we want to do um, and to expand on some of these promising practices uh, or best practices, whatever label you want, to, you want to put on them. And as David alluded to, if you look at where California is right now in per pupil funding, we are at the very bottom or near the bottom on every major indicator. And I think that that's shameful. And we can do better. We have the resources to do better. The superintendent of public instruction alluded to this when he uh, came here this morning and spoke. Uh, this is something that I know that all of us agree that we can and we need, we need to do better so that we can provide the professional uh, learning environments for our teachers and for our professional staff. Uh, related to that, I want to talk about something. I just, I wanna, it connects to the money. One of the things that we as an org, CSBA does as an organization every single year, we are in the unfortunate position of having to oppose bills in the legislature for one particular reason oftentimes, and that's because they're unfunded mandates. And if you're not familiar with that term, I want you to get familiar with it, because I will tell you on an annual basis, our organization, I'm sure Wes's and CTAs and others, we end up being a part of an effort to stop unfunded bills to the tune of at least 600, to a billion, 600 million to a billion dollars every single year. Those are the ones we're able to stop. The ones we're not able to stop from being enacted, guess what? They're thrust on districts and county and offices of education. So what that means is now they have to do something. They have to pull resources away from the types of things that we're saying are important to fund these other unfunded mandates. And when you top that on or layer that on the fact that we're already in an underfunded system, you can see how this cycle that we're all trying to address just continues. So my point in saying that is, I think there needs to be, we can walk over to the legislature and to the governor's office and we can talk about money, but I also think there needs to be a conversation about alignment with the priorities established in the state budget and the bills that ultimately get signed and what impact they have. Because right now we have a huge disconnect and everyone wants to talk about, oh, we're putting, we're gonna do this for schools, we're gonna do that for schools, and the money doesn't follow. And districts continue to struggle. We're trying to find resources to do these types of things that we wanna to do to recruit and retain our teachers, provide professional learning uh, environments um, for, for our teachers, um, and provide uh, uh, supports and services to our students. So from my perspective, I think that's, that's a critical piece. The last thing, thank you for two minute warning, is, uh, <laughs> is um, Wes talked about uh, governance training. Um, we represent board members on the county and, and at the school district level. We have been saying that since almost the beginning of time. We actually do training for our members, but think about this. School districts and county offices of education in a lot of communities are the largest employers, employ hundreds to thousands of individuals. They have budgets anywhere from $50,000 to over a billion dollars plus. They are elected officials. They come in, they have to make decisions, they have to make policy decisions, they have to make budgetary decisions. They have to create that, they have to work with the superintendent and staff to create that vision that we heard uh, about today and that's uh, referenced in the report. But at no point do we think that it's important for them to understand and be trained like other officials, whether it's on ethics or other things. And I think we've reached a place now where from our perspective it's critically important that we need to support board members um, to be good governance leaders and, and learn how to do that. And it's just not on the job training. We as an organization do that and we'll continue to do that and expand our reach, but we think it's something that, that needs to be done. And so with that, I will, um, I know we have about maybe a minute left and I'll open it up to the rest of the panel to, to comment on anything that you'd like. 
the only thing I'll add is, you know, we did our best work when, we were, when there were less resources on the table. We learned what it was, what it meant to be really collaborative and not co-labor together. And originally we were co-laboring. And when there's less food on the table, less resources, we had to come together. And that's where Sanger started to do its best work. When we realized that the, the shift in culture and organization was predicated on four simple questions. Mm -hmm. Do I know what's expected of me at work? Do I have the resources to do my job well? Is there someone at work that, need, that actually cares about my personal growth? In the last seven days, has someone told me good job? When it came down to those four things and three initiatives, we started to do the right work. And I think as we think about it from the state level, we've got to figure out how to, how to translate policy so that school districts can do that work. I think the main piece that I want to thank the state for is they've given us some time, right? And so in the old accountability system, right, you were, we were, there were things that happened to you, right? They've given us time. They've also given us local control, right? And to me, it's this loose, tight piece. It's, that's pretty loose, right? I think what we're learning now is, is that there's some other things we need to tighten, right, a little bit in regards to that. And some of that is there are, as example as you saw in these outliers report, there are best practices and there is good work happening across the state. There always has been, right, and there's continuing to be there. How do we fund more of that type of work? Mm -hmm. And one of the things you'll see, I know we've done some work in our models of continuous improvement. We went and did some of our first work in uh, Chula Vista. And in particular, what you see in those districts that are functioning really well and doing really well with kids is they're working collaboratively across the district with leadership teams of various stakeholders all at the table together in the design of the system, right? Most of where we see where folks are not being as successful is, is where the stakeholders are not engaged and they're not part of that work, right? And in particular, I would say in our system right now, I, I appreciate the reference to teachers earlier, right? Teachers are the ones who are making the difference for children every day in classrooms. Mm -hmm. That's where the work happens, right? We understand that. We, we need to figure out how do we get them more involved in the design instead of the responding to what it is that we're designing for right. them, right? And I think there's, we need to be a little bit more intentional about that, put more resources around that. And I think if we continue to do that and learn from some of that good work out there, so I really appreciate what David said to where it's not, no longer an outlier, mm -hmm. It's the norm mm -hmm. is where we're going to make a difference for kids in this, this state. All right. Thank you, Tom. Mary. Final uh, word? Final word. Okay. <laughs> Bring it, Tom. I, it's, a, it's a great time to be in education and in education policy. I'm echoing somebody or everybody up here. Um, we have the elements we need in the state of California to be extremely successful. We need time to really develop that capacity, develop our capacity to put these systems in play in ways that are working. We need to stay committed absolutely to the notion of continuous improvement where we're constantly looking at the results we're achieving and adjusting our course to achieve the goal that we set for ourselves. It's a good time to be here right now doing this work. So please join me in thanking the panel as well as LPI for hosting this event today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vernon and panelists, for that great discussion. My name is Naomi Andrasik, and I'm a senior researcher and policy advisor with the Learning Policy Institute. Before I move on to introduce our final speaker, I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank everyone in the audience for your thoughtful engagement during that first panel. That part of the event grew out of some survey responses we got at our last event back in February, our California Way event, where some folks asked us for extra time to engage with each other and with the material. I hope you feel like you've gotten some of that today. And I also hope that you'll take some time to give us some great feedback through the surveys on your tables before you leave today. So with that, on to the fun part. I get to introduce our final speaker, Linda Darling Hammond, our president and CEO. She's well known around these parts, so she doesn't need a long introduction. Suffice it to say that her experience and her insights have made her a really valued voice as California has made this journey towards um, increased equity and deeper learning for all of our students. With that, please help me welcome Linda.
Well, I want to start by thanking Naomi, who is uh, largely responsible for all the details of this event. So let's thank Naomi. And all the other staff at LPI who um, really contributed to this. Um, I want to thank all of you who contribute to the education of our children through teaching and leading, uh, through research and policy, through cheerleading and advocacy. Uh, I want to thank the many authors of these studies uh, who were out into these districts for uh, multiple rounds of data collection. Uh, and then I also want to thank all of you for listening so closely through the jackhammers and the sirens, <laughs> the train whistles, the clanging bells. We've had quite an accompaniment to this morning, kind of like being at school. Uh, through all the distractions and all the obstacles, we carry on. Uh, it uh, takes a room full of educators to kind of uh, go with this flow. Um, so it's important to understand, uh, and the reason that LPI did this study, it's really important to understand what works from research and evidence and not just ideologies. Uh, education in the United States and California has been highly politicized over recent decades. Uh, and a lot of times proposed reforms have been based on political and ideological grounds rather than evidence about what works. Uh, we've had curriculum wars of all kinds that come and go. I remember when I first came to California, I was told that uh, the reading wars were going on then, if you remember the reading police. I was told that phonics was the new F word in California. It's a phonics joke, if you think about it, you'll, you'll get it. Uh, but there are, there are some limits to politics as a way of guiding our work. Uh, as one person said, politics is the gentle art of getting votes from the poor and campaign funds from the rich by promising to protect each from the other. And education, on the other hand, is the art of building collaboration among human beings to help each of them achieve their potential. And that definition, I think, is important. Uh, you note that I did not say that education is the art of ranking, selecting, and sorting students to distinguish those who are worthy of excellent opportunities from those who are not. <laughs> Yet, as you know, many of the features of the education system we have inherited are designed to do just that. Unequal funding across districts and communities uh, is part of that selecting, sorting, and ranking. Unequal access to fully qualified teachers is part of that selecting, sorting, and ranking. Tracking systems that create unequal access to high quality curriculum. Norm reference testing systems that are designed to rank so that uh, students against each other, rather on rather narrow dimensions, rather than to measure the growth of students across multiple dimensions. Uh, and that's, uh, the inheritance that we have in much of our education system. And these positive outliers have found ways to push against the grain of the system we have inherited. And I want to note that we're highlighting these seven districts today, but as you noted, there are many more that we uncovered in the quantitative analysis in California uh, and many small districts um, that uh, you know, we, we didn't even include in that count because we were trying to have statistical stability in the results, but lots and lots of people are doing this work in very productive ways. Um, our job at the state level is to change the grain. Rather than people having to work against the grain, we need to change the grain. Uh, and so there are, uh, I, I, would, I would really note that one of the things to note about the work of these districts is how they've disproved some of the myths of older reforms. For one thing, and this has been brought out by a lot of the panelists, they've demonstrated that continuity and steady work, continuity in the leadership, continuity in the teaching force, continuity in the nature of the work that continuously improves, not disruption and continual change uh, is part of the secret sauce for, uh, for success. Uh, it is not the case that uh, these are districts with superintendents every year and a half, teachers who come in for a short period of time sink or swim and leave, uh, fire bad teachers as a major strategy for getting better. There was a theory that was put forward a while ago that you know if you just fired the bottom 5% of your teachers each year, your districts would get better. and. 
Um, you know, having studied a lot of countries around the world, I used to point out that you cannot fire your way to Finland. Uh, in fact, you know, Finland, which ranks highly internationally, does that by investing in the quality of teachers and leaders over time. Almost nobody leaves the system uh, because they are both respected and invested in. Um, so what we saw in these districts are investments in the pipelines into teaching and leadership and into teaching. A second myth that is uh, countered by this evidence uh, is that they really uh, invested in support for social emotional learning and positive behavior, not zero tolerance, uh, not you know uh, one strike you're out, uh, not punishing and pushing kids out of school. We heard a lot about the work that was going on in terms of social emotional learning, uh, positive behavior supports. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of evidence that that brings greater safety to schools. Uh, we don't need guns for teachers. Uh, we need social, emotional learning, conflict resolution, uh, and positive behavior supports uh, through the support that goes on for community building. A third myth that uh, I think is uh, countered by this evidence uh, is the no excuses idea of schooling, that you know, poverty doesn't matter, just double down, you know, look straight ahead, follow the line. Uh, attention to student needs. We heard about you know, the, the sending kids home with bath, backpacks full of food for the weekend, as well as being sure that they are well cared for, uh, loved and uh, supported with food and counseling and the supports that they need. Uh, asking what they need rather than punishing them for not having. A uh, fourth area that I think uh, we see uh, a difference is uh, that these districts really focused on unpacking and understanding the new standards rather than shoving them down people's throats or attaching them to sanctions. And I don't know if you remember, you know, we don't always have a long um, institutional memory in education, but some years ago when Common Core state standards were going across the country, and they ended up being rejected in a number of states. Uh, one of the states that uh, ended up doing that was New York, where I had been prior to California, where Common Core came in uh, with a very short time frame, very little professional development, tied to high stakes testing, which was used to deny students advancement to the next grade or diplomas, to uh, make decisions about teacher tenure uh, and pay, to make decisions about what schools would be closed. Uh, and Common Core, you know, a curriculum reform that could bring higher order thinking skills to kids, became associated with punishments for schools, teachers, and children uh, because it was shoved down people's throats rather than uh, an enabling force. So I think these districts really showed how that enabling could take place. A fifth area was that they really uh, talked about expanding access to cur curriculum, to rigorous curriculum not pulling out students who are behind and restricting the curriculum. I don't know if you remember the olden days uh, when we had um, an approach in California where kids who were scoring poorly would get pulled out of science and social studies, music and art, get denied recess, forget about library time, sit for two hours and drill for the test in reading and another two hours and drill for the test in math. Everything we know from the science of learning and development about what works for brain development and for uh, productive behavior is violated by the way that uh, we treated kids when they had low test scores. Uh, so these districts really expanded access to rigorous curriculum rather than restricting access. A sixth, of course, is that they, we heard a lot about this, really great stories of early intervention without labeling, rather than testing for labeling and segregation of students. But how do we figure out what kids need, get it to them right at the moment they need it, and then they can go on and be part of the community of learners. And finally, you know, establishing trust and supports rather than shaming and blaming. So I think we've seen you know, a real uh, important uh, body of knowledge about how to make the right kinds of changes at the district level. Now, how is California changing the grain so the districts don't have to go against the grain in order to do this? Well, we've also heard that we're making some strides. You know, LCFF does bring more equitable funding and the possibilities of uh, kids getting access to 
uh, the resources that they need. Greater investments in teacher quality, which Mary ticked off every, uh, <laughs> every um, item of. Uh, the money that's been put into trying to address teacher shortages, beginning to invest in professional development. We've got an emphasis now on multiple measures of learning and opportunity. I think that the measuring of opportunity is as, as important as measuring the outcomes. It's not just about the achievement gap, it's about the opportunity gap. And we're beginning to surface what the aspects of the opportunity gap are in the dashboards and in the work that districts and schools are doing, looking at whether kids have uh, in addition to useful outcomes, do they have access to rich curriculum, to social emotional learning supports, to positive school climate, et cetera? And we're seeing the results. Um, you know, it's really interesting. There were, uh, California's been really into the LCFF process for about five, we're going on six years of really doing this work. In 2007, we were 48th in the nation in eighth grade reading. 47th and 8th grade math. By 2017, we were uh, almost at the national average in 8th grade reading, one point below the national average on the national assessments. And we had closed the distance, the gap in math between us and the national average in half. Our graduation rates went up to the highest we've had, uh, even after some readjustments for how we count graduation and exceed those in the nation as a whole. San Diego is one of the districts that are measured by the National Assessment of Educational Progress in the TUDA assessments, and they had the steepest gains of any district in the country and are now near the top of urban districts in the country. So there is progress being made, but we have a lot more to do. Somebody referenced the fact that John Merrow did a film about California, uh, which he entitled From First to Worst, uh, about the deep decline that we experienced when disinvestment was going on. I think we are uh, in a position to move now from worst to first. And we've got to be really clear-headed about what the steps are that are going to help us get there. Um, I think one of those is that we have to continue the march to adequacy and funding in the state. Uh, we are now actually um, because of LCFF and the Prop uh, 30 monies, we're now 25th in the nation in terms of the amount of money being spent. But when you put in our cost of living, we're back down to 41st. So, you know, cost of living is an issue here. We've got to get to a place where we are uh, investing what's necessary. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. We have a lot of untapped resources for educational investment. We need to educate rather than incarcerating. We've been spending $60,000 a year on each young person who's incarcerated when we wouldn't spend 10,000 a year on them to ensure that they were literate and able to graduate from high school. That has got to change. Uh, the other thing that really was pronounced, it was the degree to which these districts uh, and the state as a whole needs to really uh, take into account uh, the wraparound supports that are necessary for kids to be healthy and to develop properly. We are in a moment in American history where the nation is involved in aggressive neglect of its children. The levels of poverty, the increasing, the ever increasing levels of homelessness, uh, the ever-increasing levels of food insecurity uh, and insecurity around healthcare, not to mention the deportations and the family breakups and all the rest of the um, horrific uh, anti-family uh, activity that is going on. And we're going to have to, as a state, really be sure that the wraparound supports are available and that our schools can be a hub of safety and support for children for their, the needs that they have as human beings to learn and develop so that we can make progress. There have been efforts made in this direction. We've got a, a long way to go to organize those, to orchestrate them, to make them less than a few competitive grant programs here or there that you have to chase after. Um, New York State, for example, has a community schools formula grant for every high poverty community that allows the building of the wraparound supports for every one of those schools. There are other states that are looking at systemic ways to meet the needs of children. Um, 
We have to also evolve our dashboard and our data for districts and schools and support how they can use it well. Uh, for example, in areas like school climate data, where we can, um, make, a, we can make a lot of uh, progress by knowing how children are experiencing school every year, not necessarily every other year, uh, and teaching people how to use those data to put those supports in place. Um, Early childhood education, of course, is a huge uh, investment on the horizon. The governor has made that clear. Uh, in the getting down to facts studies, uh, what they found was that kids in California make greater gains than kids in other states of the same income levels between K through 12. They're actually progressing at a steeper rate, but they come into kindergarten on average further behind. So if we want to really uh, make progress, we've got to make those investments wisely, thoughtfully, uh, and in a whole child manner uh, in uh, early childhood. And then what we've talked a lot about today, and this is going to be a major agenda for us, is building that system of support for learning. We should have a state in which every educator who wants to learn how to improve their practice around any dimension of the schooling process, whether it's math education, English language arts, English learner development, whether it's science and STEM and technology and engineering, whether it's social emotional learning, reducing suspensions, improving school climate, that there is readily available, high quality, sustained available professional learning opportunities that you can access as a whole school, as a department, as an individual, uh, to improve practice. And teachers should not have to look under rocks you know, for knowledge, like is this the place where I'm gonna find the answer? So that's gotta be a goal for us. We've gotta solve teacher shortages by making the investments. Uh, you know, in countries around the world, again, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. If our teachers were coming up in Finland or Singapore or many other countries, they would go through their preparation programs which are uniformly high quality, free of charge, uh, with a stipend while they train. They would go into readily available mentoring programs and then have readily available professional learning. Uh, it is something that California not only should aspire to and envision, but enact over the coming years. And I think that we've got, you know, in the form of the work that's going on at the CDE and CCEE and CTC, uh, a lot of the elements of that. So part of our job is really to do the stitching, the investing, the orchestrating that's going to be necessary um, so that we can learn from success and then pointing that professional learning at the things we know that actually are successful rather than random acts of innovation that are like popcorn reform that come and go. So we heard about, for example, reading recovery. Reading recovery is one of the worldwide uh, interventions for reading that has hundreds of studies finding that 90 plus percent of the kids who have that experience that we heard about from Gridley um, learn to read successfully whether they are students who have been identified with special educational needs, whether they are English learners or language learners of any kind, or whether they are just um, uh, slower to get to the reading process. Um, that's one example of many, but we do know a lot, and we've seen in these districts things that work. And we shouldn't pretend that any effort is likely to be as successful as any other effort. We should build on the knowledge base, build on the research base, uh, and you know, use what we know, uh, at, both in California and, I know this is heresy, even beyond the borders of California, um, to, to learn how to uh, organize that system of support. So um, you know, I just wanna close by noting that uh, we have been through a lot of reforms of various kinds over many decades, uh, but many uh, years ago, Horace Mann, who was sort of in some ways the founder of public education in the common school, made the point that where anything is growing, one former is worth a thousand reformers. And I think in this room are many of the formers of California's public education system 
and we need to support each other with knowledge and resources and commitment to take this state from worst to first. Thank you. share this applause with all of you, with my LPI colleagues, and I think I am in the position of uh, giving us a benediction, and uh, may the force go with you. <laughs> <laughs>